This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. As we roar into the holiday season and I jet around the world on my private Gulf Stream, looking down upon the proletariat, not exactly. Close, but not exactly. Now I'm just talking a little shit to open this podcast up. A little best of for the holiday week here. I want to reach back into my archives and pull out an Annie Duke episode. The professional poker player turned risk betting maestro. Plus a great series of excerpts from Charlie Bunger and Warren Buffett. Timeless wisdom that if you forget, that's why you're listening right now. Because I'm here to remind you during the holiday season of 2019... There are timeless pieces of insight that none of us can afford to forget, or we will just become broke and stupid. Without any further delay, let's jump right into a little Annie Duke, a little Charlie Munger, and a little Warren Buffett. My guest today is the author of a new book, Thinking in Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. She has appeared on this podcast twice before, but this is her first book, and I'm so appreciative that she has appeared yet again. Annie Duke has devoted her life to the study of decision-making under pressure. She's had a prior career as a professional poker player, won over $4 million in tournament poker, but now with this book... She's gone ahead and taken her poker expertise, her graduate level research in psychology, and she's combined it all into a unique perspective that we can all apply to our everyday lives. Without further ado, let's jump right in with Annie Duke. So, Annie, I must offer the congratulations. You have had quite a few achievements in your life already, but I have a sneaky suspicion that this book stuff is going to raise the profile in a way that even you might not expect. I'm not predicting, nor do I know what that raising of profile will be, but considering the content, which covers so many areas, so many walks of life, I have a sneaky suspicion in a year's time, if we chat again, you're gonna be like, yeah, that was a real game changer. I hope so. I mean, you know, that's why I wrote it. I'm not with the idea of game changer, but this is material that I've been thinking about in some form or another since the late eighties. Really. I mean, if you count my graduate school experience, but then in a, in a really formalized form since really 2002, since I asked to, since I was asked to give my first talk to a group of options traders. What I really love about that is that when you have, when you're giving talks and you have to deliver it sort of spoken word and you're getting immediate feedback from the audience, you figure out a lot of stuff that you thought you knew that you didn't know because you can't actually express it coherently. That is such an amazing process to sort of hone down and figure out how to communicate these, these complex concepts in a way that people can really digest them. After having done that for 10 years, I really resolved that I was going to write this book. So this is really the product of that work, which I'm really excited about. No, we've actually kind of talked about it briefly on prior episodes. Going through your acknowledgments, I was thinking, how many folks have I had on this show? Well, your brother's not in this, been on this show, but I've interviewed your brother. Dan Airely, Colin Cameron, Phil Tetlock, Gabrielle Ottigen. She was one of my favorites because I don't know, there was something about her content, her voice. By the end of that episode, I was like, can I come be your grad student? I just wanted to go to her class. She's amazing. And what I love about her is that in the midst of boom and craze about positive psychology, she was this very dissenting voice with very real and robust data. 
And she's very passionate about that data and what it says. And she she's amazing. The data really gets at so much of the foundation of this work that you've put together. Before I jump into the work, I want to ask something. I don't think you wrote about it in the book. It's a great example, in my humble opinion. But I'm watching an entire generation right now. Let's say this is 20 to 35, roughly. I think this might be what they call the millennial generation. And as a guy who's written some trading books, I'm watching an entire generation go goo goo gaga over cryptocurrencies, <laughs> over weed stocks. And what's really interesting is that the very topics that you talk about, which are like foundational to making decisions for what they are putting their money into, what I am seeing just on a kind of cursory analysis is literally across Facebook, no comprehension. These aren't necessarily unwise or you know dumb people, but literally no comprehension of the types of issues that you're putting in your book, starting with the big picture of like, hey, it's a bet. And you've got to be thinking that this bet might not turn out exactly as you expect. I have to agree. I was actually asked about what I thought about cryptocurrency recently. I'm just going to say I, I haven't looked at it that much. It's not something that I'm particularly interested in getting a big knowledge base about. I'm probably not going to, not. I have no plans to invest in it. I have other things that I'm putting my knowledge base for, but the thing that I said to your point was, well, I haven't really researched it much, but if I had to give sort of the cursory opinion about it, the minute I saw McAfee start saying it's impossible for a cryptocurrency to bubble, I would be very cautious for exactly the reasons that you just said, which was sort of across, you know, that my knowledge of cryptocurrency is coming from some cursory articles that I've read and, but really seeing what people are saying in the cryptocurrency community on, on Twitter to each other. Uh, and it seems to be a really big echo chamber of confirmation bias, a lot of um, bandwagoning. I just don't seem to see a, a whole lot of dissenting voices saying, hey, wait a minute, this is high volatility. And the other thing that I think is really interesting about it is that I see a lot of tribalism with cryptocurrency, like I'm a Bitcoin person, but I'm this other person. And now I'm going to, you know, cause I'm into Bitcoin, I'm going to run down your cryptocurrency. And then the people in the other cryptocurrencies are running down this other cryptocurrency. So it does seem to be a lot of cognitive biases sort of coming really visibly up to the surface around that particular issues. But you talk about, hey, you know, this is not your expertise, but I think if I kind of blur my eyes and look at the cover of your book right now, thinking in bets, I mean, decision making, we could be talking about widgets. It doesn't have to be cryptocurrencies. Decision making is decision making and good decision making and understanding uncertainty and luck and skill and all this stuff. It doesn't make a difference whether Andy Duke knows really anything about cryptocurrency. You know about the foundational precepts that we as human beings should probably be thinking about if we want to be successful in the long run. That was kind of the point of what I just said is that I haven't studied it deeply enough that I would feel comfortable giving someone financial advice but about it. But what I do see is this sort of a lot of people talking about it being a sure thing. A lot of people talking about it as if it can't bubble, for example, that it couldn't go down, that, you know, this tribalism where people are attacking each other. And not really understanding, look, you're investing in something that's high volatility. We'll have to just wait a little while to see how that all shakes out. Let me jump into an example straight from your book. This is an example that I remember debating with friends a couple years ago. And I want to kind of bring it up in the beginning of the podcast and maybe a little bit at the end, too. And I had my strong opinions about it. And I, and I have to admit, reading your book, I, I know the things that you were talking about, but I wasn't thinking about it in the passionate moment of judging Pete Carroll's decision to throw. It's one of those things where I might have said to myself, gosh, I've watched a lot of NFL football. He should have just given it to Marshawn Lynch and let him run it and let the chips fall where they may. But there's a different way of looking at this, and I have to acknowledge that the way you lay it out is probably the way that we all should be thinking about it. Let me just remind everybody of the decision that you're talking about. I'm sure that people in Seattle remember it and people in New England remember it, but there's 26 seconds left in the Super Bowl in 2015, and the Seahawks are on the one-yard line. They are four points behind. Now, it's important to know that the Seahawks have uh, only one timeout here. Uh, and that's just a, a, an important detail. 
Now, obviously, Marshawn Lynch at this time is considered to be the best running back in the NFL. In general, people were expecting that Pete Carroll was going to call a run play. Russell Wilson was going to hand the ball off to Marshawn Lynch uh, and try to drive it across the goal line. He didn't do that. He called for Wilson to pass the ball. And as pretty much everybody will remember, the ball then got intercepted in the end zone, end of game, Patriots won. And maybe you could recall for me some of the headlines from the next day. Pete Carroll doesn't know what he's doing, et cetera, et cetera. I think it was a lot of worst call in Super Bowl history. There were a lot of big exclamation points. I think the word idiot was used in some, actually, I think it was effing idiot in one of the online sites. So people were really, 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 really upset about this call. They really thought that it was was absolutely the worst call. I actually opened the book with this particular situation, with this particular anecdote. I go through exactly what just happened. I walk through what I just walked through with you. And then I just ask a very simple question. What do you think those headlines would have looked like if the ball were caught in that end zone? Genius. He's a genius. I think they probably would have said something like he outsmarted Belichick because now the unexpectedness of the play would have been considered brilliant, right? This is the most brilliant call in Super Bowl history. Everybody was expecting the ball to be handed off to Marshawn Lynch and Pete Carroll outsmarted Belichick and had Russell Wilson pass. It, it takes a very simple thought experiment to see that there, there's a problem here in the way that that analysis was done, which mainly had to do with people were deriving the quality of Pete Carroll's decision from the quality of the outcome that occurred. Obviously, it was a very bad quality outcome, right? He, they lost the game on an interception. Uh, and people were using that as a, as a very tightly correlated signal, let's say, to what the decision quality was there. That's in poker, what we call resulting. Uh, and resulting is a really wonderful word to have in your vocabulary. If you're in cognitive science, you would call it outcome bias. I love the word, re word resulting a lot better because I feel like it's very self-explanatory. You're using the result in order to figure out whether the decision was good. I'll just walk you through really quickly the analysis that shows you that actually the call was mathematically pretty good. At the time, there were some dissent, uh, dissenting voices. One of uh, the people that you can go look at is Benjamin Morris on 538 if you want to go, if you're just curious to go see an analysis, but I'll give a summary. There's 26 seconds left. They have one timeout on the one yard line. Uh, if they call a run play and Marshawn Lynch doesn't get it to the end zone, they can call exactly one timeout and then hand it off to Marshawn Lynch one more time. So they get two plays. It's second down, by the way. If they pass it, here's what happens most of the time. Sometimes it's caught and sometimes it's dropped. That accounts for 99% of the occurrences. Uh, in the case that it's caught, the game is over and the Seahawks win. In the case that it's dropped, what happens? The clock stops. At which point they can hand it off to Marshawn Lynch. If he doesn't get into the end zone, they can call a timeout that they now have left and hand it off to Marshawn Lynch again. So people understand that pass was essentially a free option. About 1% of the time, it's going to get intercepted. There's some other things that can happen like a fumble or a sack, but those can happen on the on the running play anyway. So about 1% of the time that pass is going to get intercepted. In that sense, you can see that that pass is a nearly free option to get it into the end zone, preserving the option to run the two running plays also. What I say is you may agree or not agree with this analysis. And again, you can go look at Benjamin Morris's analysis to see a, a really more deeply what the statistics look like there. But what I think is interesting is that the outcome was so bad that people didn't even give Pete Carroll the credit of, of having thought it through. And once you actually run through uh, what the analysis looks like, it actually starts to look like a pretty good decision. And that's aside from, you know, you don't always want to hand it off because, you know, then you're too easy to defend against, um, which people might say, oh, but you shouldn't do that in the Super Bowl. Except, as I say in the, the book, it's really all one long game, um, which is a whole other thing. But you can, I think you can see that clearly he was thinking it through. And the chorus of people just yelling that this was the most idiotic play ever uh, were really guilty of resulting. You know what's really tricky about it, too, is that with the Super Bowl, the last play of the Super Bowl, so much on the line, 
But then you can think of the thousands and thousands and thousands of play calls that Pete Carroll has made in his career, likewise with Bill Belichick. And Pete Carroll, I mean, he's not had the same success as Bill Belichick, but he's had a lot of success. So you're right. He clearly knows something about NFL play calls. And what he knows is not every one of those calls is going to be successful. And he's comfortable with that. He knows that's part of the process. Clearly, he got to the Super Bowl by making calls like that. That's what I think. You know, when we get on these big stages, uh, actually, interestingly enough, on big stages like the Super Bowl, they've shown that coaches get more conservative and they actually don't go for it enough on fourth down and, you know, so, so on and so forth. So we've made a lot of progress kind of, you know, from the Sabre metrics perspective of really getting uh, coaches have gotten a lot better about things like fourth down calls. Um, but what you see is that you kind of roll back to a more old school play calling style when you get onto these very big stages in general with, with coaches in general. And I think it's because they're worried that the fans and the newspapers, the pundits, that they're all going to be resulting. If you happen to have one of these calls that isn't quite so obvious, not work out. So what I say is kudos to Pete Carroll for saying, I know it's the Super Bowl and I understand I'm risking that people are going to result on me and, you know, say it's the worst call, call in Super Bowl history or scream that I'm an idiot. But I'm willing to do what's mathematically correct here, at least as, in his opinion, uh, which I really love. You know, I love that he was willing to do that. And I think that makes him a, a much greater coach for it, personally. He was just unlucky. He was just unlucky. And it was interesting because he went on um, Good Morning America and he was asked about that call. And, and he said something really interesting. He said, I, it, it was the worst result of a call in Super Bowl history. So clearly Pete Carroll knows something about resulting. And I love that that was his quote. You know, there's something here, too, that maybe you might want to comment on. You know, for so much of modern life, we are all armchair Monday morning quarterbacks, whether that's watching, you know, poker on TV or a football or whatever it might be. And there is such a difference between being in the game, spending your life to get the understanding of of this whole process, making decisions, many decisions not working out, some working out, having that edge versus, you know, you just mentioned the, the hosts in Good Morning America asking, kind of going down a silly direction, really doesn't, you know, more of the kind of like headline grabbing direction. Let's see if Pete Carroll will say he was an idiot, something stupid like that. But it's it's really interesting that we've become a very voyeuristic society where, and again, I think your your new book serves a, a nice uh, a nice place on the shelf for that to get people behind the scenes as to how the top decision makers really do it because it's all applicable to our own lives. Well, I, I, I completely agree with you. And, and the thing is that one of the problems with resulting is that you do feel really smart once you know the outcome, the decision-making that we make every single day in our own lives is decisions under conditions of uncertainty, right? We don't have all the information that we need in order to make the decision. And we don't, I mean, and there's a lot of luck, right? So we have two sources of uncertainty really coming in on us, right? We can make a perfect decision and it can work out really badly. We can make a terrible decision and it can work out really well. Decisions and outcomes are really only loosely correlated. And then we have this problem of hidden information. So in poker, for example, the cards are face down and you're trying to decide what to do against your opponent um, when you can't see their cards. And even if you could see their cards, you could get unlucky, right? Because you can just have things not work out. So a very simple example of that that I would give from life is I can run a red light and not get a ticket and not get in an accident. But I think we can all agree that running a red light is not a good decision. And I can go through a green light following all the traffic rules, the speed limit. My car can be in perfect condition. I can make sure that I'm driving in good weather conditions. All of that, I can be as careful and as good a decision maker as I can going through a green light, and I can still get T-boned. What I think is really interesting is that it is really easy to be a Monday morning quarterback once you know the outcome. If, if you make this mistake of saying, well, I know the outcome, so therefore the decision must have been bad, or I know the outcome, so therefore the decision must have been good. And what I really argue in the book is that that's not a bad strategy if you're playing chess, right? So if I were to say to you, hey, you know, Michael, what's the worst decision that you made in the last year? 
and you were a chess player, it would kind of make sense for you to go back and find some game that you just lost in spectacular fashion. Um, and then go find the errors that you made in there because surely if you lose a game of chess, you made some bad decisions in there. there we know that. Um, and that the reason for that is that chess, very much unlike life, is a game that doesn't have any hidden information. You can see all the pieces. Um, and it has very little luck. It has a little bit of luck, but very little. So it's a lot easier to kind of do that derivation from the way that the game turned out. But in poker, that's a really bad thing to do. Just because I lost a hand does not, not not mean I played it poorly. And just because I won a hand does not mean I played it well. And if I make the mistake of connecting those together too tightly, my decision-making is going to be really messed up. I'm not going to learn well from the way that things are turning out. I'm not going to use my experience very well to become an expert. And I think that part of the problem is that in life, we treat it like we're playing a game of chess when we're not. We're playing a game of poker. And one of the things you can imagine for me is that you see all of these things of, oh, he's playing three-dimensional chess, right? I mean, this is how we say, like, oh, look at what a smart decision maker is. He's playing three-dimensional chess. It kind of does. It's meaningless. Yeah, I mean, that that's right. I want to yell at the world, like, no, he, if they're a really good decision maker, they're not playing three-dimensional chess. They're playing three-dimensional poker. Take that for a second as we talk about poker, and we've talked about poker on prior podcasts, but for those out there, they might say to themselves, oh, you know, it's just a game, da, 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 da. However, and you go in this, you go in this direction in your work, and I kind of love it. I don't, I didn't really know that connection myself. Game theory, game theory, modeling poker. Why don't you explain that? This is actually a fun thing I do when I give my talks. Uh, so, you know, I do keynotes, I do corporate retreats. I do deep dive consulting also, um, where I might go into this, but in the keynotes, I always go into this. So I always ask the audience, Hey, th does anybody in the audience know who John von Neumann is? And, you know, and I'll, I'll speak to pretty large audiences and I'll get like a hand or two will go up, at, which is fine. Cause not a lot of people know who he is. Then I'll follow the question with, you know, okay, that's average for the audiences that I talk in front of. Does anybody know who John Nash is? And now I'll get a, I'll, I'll get a few more hands. Um, and then I'll ask if anybody knows who Russell Crowe is. And then of course I get the whole, the whole audience. Their <laughs> hand. And then I'll say, okay, so has anybody, you know, seen the movie, a beautiful mind? And then you, Oh, okay. Um, and now I, I, I'll walk them back from that. So a beautiful mind was about John Nash, who as your listeners might recall, Nobel laureate, uh, in the field of game theory, um, famously, um, schizophrenic, uh, but brilliant mathematician. And he studied at the Institute for Advanced Study, and his mentor was John von Neumann. Um, and John von Neumann was, among other things, the father of the modern computer. Uh, he actually ran the Manhattan Project. I think because of that, actually ended up getting cancer, ended up with pancreatic cancer in, in the 1950s. He ran our Cold War strategy. He's the one who came up with the idea of mutually assured destruction. But uh, while he was working on the Manhattan Project, he was moonlighting with um, Oscar Morgenstern, and he wrote a book called The Theory of Games, which is an incredibly influ influential book. Uh, and he's really considered the father, uh, along with Morgenstern, the father of modern game theory. So the way that we think about decisions under conditions of uncertainty over time is a loose definition of, of what you're doing when you're studying game theory is based on von Neumann's work. And you'll notice that if I were to give you a definition of poker, uh, that definition would align really well. I'm making, con uh, in poker, I'm making decisions under conditions of uncertainty. Again, cards face down this element of luck. Um, and it's over time. When I make a decision against you, it's not the only decision I'll make against you. I have to make future decisions against you. Uh, so there's reputational issues. Now, the fact that those definitions happen to align pretty well is not accidental. Because it turns out that John von Neumann really started thinking about this work based on a stripped down version of poker. And there's a really wonderful anecdote about von Neumann that comes from Jacob, uh, Jacob Bernowski. He says, you know, uh, he, he asked him, Hey, John von Neumann, <laughs> um, I, I, this theory of games, it's really, really interesting, but, and I'm paraphrasing here, but how come you didn't base it on the game of poker? Uh, uh, you know, this theory of games, super interesting. But how come you didn't base it on the game of chess? Isn't chess like, you know, the ultimate game? And von Neumann's answer went something like this. Chess, well, chess isn't even a game. It's a calculation. 
poker is a game. So you can see the full quote in my book. It's just a paraphrase. But what he's getting at there is that because chess has no hidden information and very little luck, it's a game that is solvable in the same way that checkers is solvable or the game of tic-tac-toe, which all 10-year-olds basically have solved. As long as you have enough computing power, you should be able to solve the game of chess, meaning you should be able to uh, create a decision tree that gets you all the way out to the end of the game, so all possible moves and counter moves. Um, and we're, we're pretty close to that. Uh, there isn't a human being that can be a chess computer anymore. Um, but poker is a much more difficult um, problem to solve because you have hidden information and you have this, this luck element. So he was really basing the kind of decisions that, that we're studying in game theory, which is really about decision-making out in the world, on the game of poker and actually sort of poo-pooed the game of chess as, as a good model for decision-making. So obviously, I mean, this was a really important guy. I'm, I'm a little sad that people don't remember who he was. In uh, the night, in I think it was 1950, um, Time magazine named him the most brilliant mathematician of the 20th century, um, and he just kind of got lost in the history of science, except in as much as they they're pretty sure he was one of the models for Doctor Strangelove. So that seems to be that seems to be the mark he left on the the popular culture world at any rate. I, I always say it's, he was there at the same time as Einstein, but Einstein had the advantage of the, you know, crazy hair, the mustache and the motorcycle uh, and the bicycle rather, I guess. You know, I don't know if you know of him, but there was uh, Thomas Schnelling and uh, Robert Allman. They both shared a Nobel Prize in game theory as well. I actually had Allman on this podcast. One of my favorite ones, I think he was like 85 years old. It was spread out over two episodes. Uh, I think he was in Israel when I talked to him. And he was so fantastically lucid and just mapping out. I still love listening to how he would just, you know, map out the thinking of it. He was talking about uh, mutually assured destruction. Right. But just fantastic to, to, to listen to someone like that and then to realize that in his mind, there's math going on uh, at a level that um, I, I probably will not have a chance to understand in my, my simple life, but fantastically interesting man. I, I agree with you. Von Neumann, uh, Nash, uh, Schnelling, who just died a couple years ago, these guys would all be so fascinating to talk to. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and if, if just for fun, if people want to see an example of mutually assured destruction, I highly recommend the, game, the, the movie, rather, uh, War Games which I don't know if you remember, it stars Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick. Yeah, and they have the computer uh, start playing tic-tac-toe, if you'll recall, and the computer figures out that you can't win. And then we move on to thermonuclear war <laughs> to try to figure that problem out. It's a really wonderful movie that's actually about game theory in, in a great way. Um, and it's kind of fun to go back and look and see what the graphics look like, you know, what the computer graphics look like in, in light of today. But um it's one of my favorite movies, but it's a game theory movie. I think those screens look something like Pong circa 1975, actually. They were, even though it was pretty bad stuff. Let me take you, there's so many areas that I want to touch on, and I'm not in a linear order of your book. I've got like five pages of notes in front of me. But, but there was uh, something that I think would be nice. We're kind of already gone there a little bit, but I'd like the way you map it out in just a few words. You know, this all starts with a belief then you make the bet, then you get your set of outcomes. And you've already kind of talked about that so far. And what I just said is, is from your book. You've got a great example, though, of this. And I still, as a kid, remember this show. I still remember this episode, Laughing My Rear End Off, which that would have been the turkey episode in WKRP. And they had a, be they had a belief that was a little wrong. And so if you, if you, don't, if you don't have the belief uh, set in the, in the right way, you're going to have trouble with your betting. And then the outcome is going to be pretty predictable. I think this goes back to uh, what we sort of started this talk with about Bitcoin, right? Which is what are your beliefs about Bitcoin? How good are you at updating your beliefs and kind of checking against what the objective truth might be? Now, obviously, it's, it's very hard to know what the objective truth of anything is, but we should be, our goal should be to get closer and closer and closer to that. Um, in order to do that, we have to be really good belief updaters, right? So our beliefs are really what drive the bets we make. They, they're what drive the decisions we make about what we think the possible future uh, is going to look like. We have this, you know, set of beliefs that we form and, and we, we'll, we'll get into this maybe after the, this anecdote, but the, these beliefs can be pretty bad. 
And if your beliefs are bad, you're going to make some pretty bad bets around them. So to come to WKRP in Cincinnati, uh, for those who don't know the show, who aren't of my generation, it was a really funny show about a, a little tiny radio station, a rocket, obviously. Um, Lonnie Anderson was on it. I don't know if people remember who she was. Um, they have a news guy, Les Nessman, and a station manager, Mr. Carlson. And um, because it's, of course, a rock station, they're sort of the, you know, they're the uh, foils, right? They're sort of bumbling. Les Nessman is very uppity, and Mr. Carlson is very bumbling. But Mr. Carlson decides he, he's got this amazing idea that he's going to do as a Thanksgiving promotion. And Les Netsman is going to be out, you know, on the scene. And it, this is a promotion that's going to occur over at a mall. And Les Netsman is reporting. And he's like, and he hasn't been told by Mr. Carlson what this Turkey Day uh, promotion is going to be. So he's out at the mall and he's reporting and he's saying, okay, you know, everybody's gathering. Everybody's ready for the promotion. Oh, there's, you know, a helicopter overhead. This is really exciting. And then it just turns into mayhem and chaos as he says, wait, something's coming out of the helicopter. Wait, oh no, it's turkeys being thrown out of the helicopter. And of course, the turkeys are just raining down on the people below, and smashing into cars and, and not flying. Not flying. <laughs> exactly. And they, they come running, you know, back into the station and they're just bloodied and, you know, covered in feathers. And, uh, you know, Mr. Carlson says, as God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. And I think this is just such a wonderful example of how wrong our bets can go if our beliefs are wrong. Um, and that, you know, that's something that we all need to remember is that whatever we're betting on, whatever decisions we make are, are driven by the beliefs we have. So we, we would do well to always be double checking those beliefs. So that's a great word, double checking. You know, once you have those beliefs, once you bet and you get a a series of outcomes. So, okay, if your belief is I can throw turkeys out of a helicopter and I'm going to bet on that as a promotion and they, you know, they can't fly, the outcome is not going to be very good. You don't really have to go kind of uh, back test that or reverse engineer that to really realize that the, the, the very basic belief was wrong. But you've got a great story that I love and I want you to kind of talk about it. You talk about, I think it was your brother and Phil Ivey, and Phil, this, I think this was 2004, and Phil Ivey had won a, a tournament, and he won a ton of money, I think like a half million bucks, and he, instead of just, I don't know, celebrating or whatnot, I believe, he went back and he had a private dinner conversation with your brother, and what he was trying to do, even as the winner was reverse engineer, relook at, study, examine every play, and I'm assuming probably not only his moves, but probably everybody else at the table. Yeah, so I think, so I, I want to get to that anecdote. Let me just set it up a little bit. Just to set it up, here's, here's our basic problem, is that there's a lot of luck involved in the way that things turn out. When we think about what, what you just said, that beliefs, inform the bets that we make that then result in a set of possible outcomes, right? But now what we have to do is we have to take the way that the future unfolds for us, the, the, the outcome that actually occurs of the set of possible outcomes. And we have to figure out how to use that to loop that back in to update our beliefs so that we can be a better decision maker going forward. And here's the problem is that we can't see into what the underlying cause of a particular outcome is. It, it could be because of bad luck, right? So if I go through a green light and I get in a car accident, I got unlucky. So in that case, that outcome is not going to inform my beliefs about whether I should drive through green lights again. Hopefully not, not if I'm doing this well, right? I'm actually going to sort that off into the luck category. I'm going to throw it into the luck bucket, bucket and say, well, okay, so that particular result I shouldn't have uh, inform what my future decisions are going to be. Now, if I go through a red light and I get in a car accident, hopefully I'm saying, you know what, I should really be sorting that into the skill bucket, right? I, into the mostly skill bucket. I should use that to update my belief about whether I should go through red lights or not. But here's the problem. If you can get in an accident going through a green light or going through a red light, how can we tell? So I think one of the examples that, that I give in there is just think about you go into the doctor and you're coughing 
think about all the different reasons that you could be coughing, right? You could have a viral infection. You could have inflammation in the back of your throat that doesn't have anything to do with the virus. You could have some sort of bacterial infection. You could have cancer. You could have a neurological problem. You could have allergies. There's all sorts of reasons that you could be coughing, but all the doctor sees is the cough. And to a layman, they're all going to look relatively the same. So how do you now sort through when someone's coughing and try to go and derive um, what the underlying cause of, of the cough is? And, th and that's actually a really hard problem. And to make it worse, you know, there's very few outcomes that are solely luck or solely skill. Normally, it's some sort of combination of the two. And we're trying to sort of sort out what was it that was in our control, which would be in the skill bucket. Um, and what was it that really wasn't in our control in the luck bucket? And that decision, which is really a second bet that we make, right? We make this initial bet that results in a set of outcomes. And then once, uh, once the outcome occurs, we have to make a second bet about what part of it was in our control due to skill so that we can then become good learners about it. And what, um, part of it was due to luck, which we would just sort of offload, right? We, hopefully we wouldn't learn very much from that. So now here, here's the problem. Because this is very noisy, because this relationship between the outcomes that we have and the decisions we make is so loose, we have a lot of leeway when we're examining our own outcomes to take the bad stuff and just say, oh, that was bad luck. And to take the good stuff and to say, oh, that's because I'm such a genius. Um, and that's the tendency that we, we have when we're sort of examining why things turned out for ourselves the way we did. Right. So this is different than we're, when we're an observer of Pete Carroll and we're just saying, oh, you had this bad outcome. You must be such a bad decision maker. That doesn't have to do with our own ego. It doesn't have to do with our own life story. Once it becomes about our own life story, we, we actually make this very consistent error. It's called self-serving bias. You can see why, because it serves our own self. Um, that bad stuff is because of luck and good stuff is because of skill. And that, that becomes a really big problem for learning. That brings me to the story that you just brought up about Phil Ivey, who is one of the best poker players on earth. He's, he's really, uh, incredibly good at every single form of poker. And my brother told me a story, which I think is very illustrative of why he's so good because he's really different than the rest of us in this way. So he won a really big tournament against an all-star final table. I mean, the other players at the table were brilliant poker players in their own right. And after he won the tournament, he went off and had dinner with my brother. Instead of saying, can you believe how great I am? Look at how well I played. Of course, I deserve to win because I outplayed everybody. I'm so great, which I'm sure is talk that we all recognize in other areas of life, right? He actually did not talk at all about how well he played. All he talked about was how poorly he had played in the sense of he wasn't saying, look, I'm a really bad poker player, but he wanted to go through every single spot where he felt that he could have made a better decision. He was de deconstructing all the hands that he thought were difficult, deconstructing all the hands that he felt maybe there was a different line of play that I could take. And he was doing that with someone who he was, he felt was going to be giving him good feedback. Other, of course, it, it was one of the best poker players in the world in his own right. Um, and that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to use it all as a learning opportunity as opposed to just basking in the glow of the win. And that really shows you a different kind of mindset where we can say it's probably not accidental that he's so good. If that's the mindset that he, he has, if he's so eager to try to do this sorting of luck and skill, no matter how good the outcome is for him, he's not going to feed his ego by just basking in his glory. He's going to feed his ego by making sure that he's learning as much as he can from every experience so that he has better and better and better results going forward. And what's interesting about that, too, even though, as you just mentioned, your brother, extremely accomplished, one of the best in the world, but Phil's at the top and he's still kind of like lowering down a little and saying, dissect me, help dissect me. Let's rip me apart. Let's put it all out on the table. Let's put the blood and guts out there. I want to know what I did wrong. I want to know what I did right. Let's just get it all out there. That probably gets to some of the real important uh, takeaways from your work is how can we all think of our lives that way, right? Yeah. And the, the conclusion that I really come to, and 
I, this is really from looking at a lot of literature and, and really in particular, a lot of work from Phil Tetlock, who is University of Pennsylvania. He's at Wharton and in the Department of Psychology. Phil Tetlock and his wife, Barbara Miller, um, and also uh, uh, people like John Haidt. And there's just, there's a lot of work that really suggests that on our own, it's just really hard to do this stuff. It's really hard to try to de-bias. It's just too ingrained. And, and Kahneman actually talks about this too in Thinking Fast and Slow. Well, Kahneman is not, obviously Thinking Fast and Slow is not specifically trying to offer a lot of solutions to it. One of the things that he does say kind of at the be, you know, as he's in this book is saying he, he's starting to think that maybe better water cooler conversations might be the way to go. Um, and he, the idea behind this is we're also biased kind of on our own that what we really need to do is start forming really good decision pods, right? We, we need really constructive decision groups because if we're trying to derive this stuff on our own, we're, we're just naturally always going to default to this very sort of self-serving view of the world where, you know, in general, our beliefs are, are correct. We take credit for the things that happen in our lives that are good. And we um, offload um, the things that happen in our lives that don't turn out so good. You know, our beliefs are true. We're smart, you know, all of those things that we, we tend to really process the world in a way to support a positive self narrative. And we process the world in the moment in a way to support that. Cause one of the things that, you know, becomes obvious when you think about this is, well, okay. If I take a little bit of pain now though, and I say, okay, I, you know, I don't deserve credit for that great thing that happened or Yes, it, I, I do think that there were decisions that I made that led to this poor outcome that I could go back and change, that surely you would become a better decision maker going forward and the quality of your results would start to shift right on the distribution, right? Um, so you would get a lot of positive feedback going forward in the future, but you know, none of us are very good at imagining the future and we don't want to take the pain in the moment. So um, left our own devices, we're going to tend to default to that very biased um, interpretation of the world. It's, it's beliefs versus facts. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. Being in a good decision group is actually, I think, really the, the way to become better at this. And w one thing that I think happens a lot is that people kind of think, yes, but isn't it true? Do I really need a really strong decision group? Because isn't it true that if I know about these biases, Right. And I'm a smart person who knows how to analyze data. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm just generally like a, a super good at that stuff. Isn't it true that I'm going to inoculate myself against the biases? If I have this great combination of being smart and also knowing about them, then won't I be really hyper vigilant? And the answer is no. So it turns out that in a lot of ways, making being smart makes it worse. Smart people tend to actually, uh, have stronger blind spots to their um, biases. That's from work from Keith Stanovich. Um, and then the work of Dan Kahan at Yale shows us that being smart makes this kind of motivated reasoning um, actually much worse. Um, the more numerate you are, the better you are with numbers and statistics and that kind of thing. Uh, the better you are actually analyzing those statistics in a way that will actually support your prior. And you can think about that just in terms of spin, right? I mean, who's really good at spinning a narrative that supports their own beliefs, right? I want to add something to the smart. I had a buddy who played pro baseball, and he was a pretty smart guy. He had got signed out of grad school. He had been studying psychology. and But after, after, after he went through the whole process, he got to the 40-man roster. He blew out his shoulder. He was a pitcher. But he lamented something to me one day, and he said, you know, I wish I was like Lenny Dykstra when it came to playing baseball. Not Lenny Dykstra after playing baseball, who was pretty much a lunatic, but Lenny Dykstra playing baseball. Because Lenny Dykstra apparently would go up and face a guy throwing 95 miles an hour or whatever, 100 miles an hour, might strike out, might get a hit, but nothing phased the guy, apparently. He just, he wasn't the brightest ball, but he just was in, kind of in the moment, not allowing himself to overthink it, and... My friend was saying, gosh, you know, sometimes I think maybe some of us that know too much overthink the thing. And he was pointing out this great example of a ball player who didn't. Yeah, I think I, I think that that's part that's a problem. And, I, you know, I make the point in the book that if you're sending someone into the spin room, you know, you're a politician after a debate, you're sending someone into the spin room. Who are you sending in there? A super intelligent person who's really good at slicing and dicing. So, you know, I think that we need to remember that data does not exist in a vacuum, 
right? It needs to be interpreted by a human being. And as you know, there's all sorts of ways you can slice and dice the data. You can come at it from different frames. You know, you can, uh, you can pay attention to certain uh, data points and, and throw out others, decide that they're not important. You have to think about how are they collected? How have they been aggregated? Uh, what kind of analyses am I going to do on it? All of that, we, we just don't realize how much we're, we're doing that in a way that serves our own beliefs. I think that John Haidt said something to me that I, I think really resonated with me, which was, he said something to this effect. I, I've just realized that people are so biased that unless you have the clash of ideas out in the open square, we're all sort of doomed. I mean, it's a, it a sort of a doom and gloom. We, we don't we don't have the clash of ideas. We have pretty much on almost every issue these days. It seems like a partisan perspective gets in front of the idea almost every time. And I, I feel bad for younger people today that perhaps didn't grow up. I mean, younger people that are growing up with such a hyper-partisan world where they don't get a chance to say to themselves, gosh, I don't know anything about Annie's politics, but look at the way she plays poker. I can learn from that. And I think these days we're getting people blocked out because they don't even get a chance to get to perhaps the the the, the most important thing, which is not just partisan political opinions. That's not the, that's not important. That's just whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, and I, I think that you're getting a lot of the halo effect, right? So you have the halo effect, and then sort of the reverse of that, right? So the halo effect is if you're good at one thing, I think you're good at all sorts of other things that aren't necessarily related to the thing that you're good at. Um, and then the reverse of that would be if I don't like something about you in one domain, then I'm going to dismiss you across all domains. And when we're talking about sort of what's happening in the political world, right? If I disagree with your politics, I tend to just dismiss you altogether, you know, and sort of think your opinions have no value and you have nothing to teach me. And that's, that's really terrifying. Hey, let me, let me take you in a direction for a moment. I, can see in your book, and I know from prior conversations, you were very much going down the academic path. If a family member, if a brother, and if not, maybe his buddies did not bring you into the poker tables, uh, you might have gone down a completely different path. But, but, and, I, and of course, you, for this book, you've reached out to a lot of very, very strong, well-known academics, uh, tremendous uh, intellects. But how interesting is it for you, though, that you have this desire as a young person, you're going down this academic path, you get sidetracked. Now you kind of come back to the academic path, but you've got this interesting experience in your holster that I don't know any other academics that probably have this in their holster, right? I mean, what a cool real life direction to detour and then flip it back and come back later in life. Fun, huh? For a long time, I kind of felt like, oh, look, I'm sort of, I'm circling back. Right. So, so for your listeners, I retired from poker in 2012 and really started doing this kind of work full time again. Here's, here's the sort of timeline, right? So do you, do you, hold on. Do you like that description? Or are you kind of pushing back a little I'm bit? I'm actually going to push back on that description of kind of circling back because I'm, I'm going to make the argument that I never left. And here's why. So, you know, I'm, I'm in graduate school. I'm going off to give my job talks. I actually end up with a, a physical illness that causes me to have to take, uh, uh, to delay going out onto the job market for one year. In academics, obviously, you, you know, there's a, a season for going out onto the job market, right? So, so now I have to wait a, a full year till the next season. Um, and it's during that time that I start playing poker um, as I'm taking that time off to get healthy. <clears throat> I joke that that, you know, my break turned into 20 years. My brief respite turned into 20 years. In 2002, I do start doing this, this speaking and talking on this, but I'm fully a poker player. I, I view myself as a full-time poker player. In 2012, I cycle out as um, this more academic work starts to take much bigger uh, place in my life. But what, you know, so, so I, you, you know, if you would talk to me around 2012, I would have said, well, I've circled back around. You know, I've, I've come back home to what I was doing in the first place. But then really, I think through the, uh, a lot through the process of this book, what I realized is actually I never left. <clears throat> when I was in graduate school and I was studying cognitive psychology and specifically I was studying language acquisition, which seems like, whoa, that seems kind of far afield from poker. But what I realized is that uh, no, it's actually the exact same thing I'm studying. If you think about the problem for a child learning the first language, there's this very noisy system. 
in the sense that there are these words kind of flying around. There's all sorts of objects and actions and qualities of objects that are out in the world. And the question that I was always asking myself is how does this little tiny baby decipher some unknown word? You know, there's some word Dax and they have to figure out that that refers to the chair over in the corner, as opposed to say any of the other objects that might be in the room or some quality of the chair, like soft or brown or striped or some action that's occurring, like somebody sitting in the chair, as an example. It's very hard, right? It's a very noisy system to try to map these words onto actions, qualities, and things, and people, and sounds, and all of that stuff. And then, you know, once you've sort of done that, you've got to now take sort of the feedback that, that's being offered to you about whether you landed on the right idea and, and feed back into the, that, back into the loop. And this is a really hard problem. Kids have this solved by the time they're about two. It's actually quite remarkable. So I was thinking about these problems of how do you learn in these very noisy systems with really, really noisy feedback. I go and start playing poker. I see this now system where this thing that I had learned in psychology, which is that learning occurs when there's lots and lots of feedback tied closely in time to decisions and actions. At a poker table, that's about the best play out of that particular sentence that you can see, right? A hand of poker takes all of about, you know, maybe two minutes, including the shuffle and the deal. Um, so, and a hand of poker can contain up to 20 decisions. Lots and lots and lots of actions and decisions are occurring in a compressed period of time. And you're getting feedback right away, right, in the in this chip exchange that's occurring. I kind of realized, wow, people should really be learning very, very quickly when they're sitting at a poker table. In fact, it should be quite hard to make a living at poker if you think about that because there is so much feedback and, and so much, you know, so many decisions and actions that are occurring, and they are tied you know, you're getting the feedback within 30 seconds. I mean, this is about as fast as you can get feedback on a decision. But what I saw was that I came in and I was able to win. As I continued in the game over the course of the 20 years that I played, I saw people really stalled in their learning, despite the fact that they were getting lots of feedback that maybe the things they were doing at the table were not necessarily optimal decisions because most people are not Phil Ivey. Right. Most people aren't winning a tournament and going and talking about every single mistake they made and how, you know, trying to deconstruct every single hand that they play. Most people are not using the feedback that's being given to them. And I realized it's really because the feedback is so noisy. Right. I can have aces, the very best possible hand. You could have a seven and a two, which is the very worst possible hand, and you can still win and I can still lose. So as you're sort of sorting those outcomes out, what I noticed was that there was a very strong tendency, not just in the people that I was playing against, but certainly in myself as well, when I lost to just say, oh, that was bad luck. And when I won to say, oh, look at what a genius I am. Um, that feels pretty good to, to sort your outcomes that way. Now, it feels pretty good in the moment, but it's, it's pretty bad for the long run. But what I realized is that these problems that I was thinking about when I was in graduate school really never went away because I was thinking about the exact same problem. How do you learn when... You know, these things that you're trying to learn about are only loosely correlated with each other. Um, and there's just a lot of noise in the system. Yeah, so I've really kind of changed my viewpoint on that. And I, I don't consider it a circle back. I consider it a never exit now. And I'm ex so extremely grateful for this laboratory that I landed in. I mean, I, I just landed in this incredible natural experiment to really start thinking about these issues of how we learn. You know, and I'm so happy for all of those experiences that have, have really led me to this book. I must tell you, the word, and you know this, the word in your title that will capture the attention. I know so many trader friends that will read your book because they're going to see bets. And it, it's like a blinking light. You know, somebody has put bets in the title. I must read this book. There's something about that particular word. I don't know how it resonates with... The masses, but I know for the folks that are self-reflecting and digging in, it's a great, great word to have in the title. I mean, really, I just, I just love, I love the word bet. I don't, <laughs> it's great. Here's the thing is that I think that, you know, obviously we, again, we, we talked about this with Bitcoin, but it's really a problem with everything is that we don't think about 
the fact that our decisions are best in an explicit way. Obviously, it's always implicit that it is. Because all that a bet is, is a decision deciding I have certain resources, could be money, time, happiness, health, whatever, right? I have certain resources, they're limited, and I have to invest these li these limited resources in some sort of decision that's going to drive me towards some set of possible futures. But those futures are only possible, and there's a set of them, right? So there's an uncertain future that I'm driving myself toward. But that's exactly what a bet is. Now, we tend to think about bets um, in the traditional sense, things that occur in a casino where I take my money. In that case, that would be the limited resources, and I bet on, say, a hand of blackjack. And there's some set of possible futures, right, in which I win the hand, some in which I lose the hand, some in which I double down on my bet, and then that branches off to win and lose, right? Uh, some in which I split my cards, and that branches off into win and lose. And we're betting against somebody. In this case, it would be the house. Um, and that's the way that we tend to think about if I were to say to somebody, hey, what's a bet? That's what they would think. But what we need to realize is that every single decision we make is a bet because what we're doing is we're taking whatever limited resources we have. And again, it doesn't have to be money. And we're driving toward a set of possible futures. And what we're doing is actually mostly betting against ourselves. And what that means is that there's some version of future any. In, that occurs when future A happens, right? And there's some future fu version of future Annie that occurs when future B happens and some version of future Annie that occurs when future C happens and so on and so forth. And so when I make a decision that's driving me toward a particular set of futures, I'm saying that the Annie that exists in that particular set of futures will be better off than the Annie that exists in the set of futures that some other decision, some other bet might have driven me toward. They're really bets against ourselves, bets against different versions of future you, alternative versions of you that might occur in the future. And I think that we can all feel that really deeply under circumstances where we had some difficult decision, some difficult bet that we had to make. We were trying to decide between the two of them. And we decided on, say, option A. And it, we hurdled ourselves to a future that happened not to have worked out. And what do we all say to ourselves? Ugh, I knew it. I should have chosen option B. Why did I choose option A? Why, you know, I should have chosen option B. And that's really that alternative future version of us saying, I told you so. You're bringing up something that's so critical because so many people will perhaps at a basic level think of betting. Okay, I take a bet. Here's a potential outcome. But I think what so many people have trouble with is placing one bet and then quickly placing another and adjusting the first bet with the second bet and moving on down the chain and that life becomes, as you're saying, thinking of bets, life becomes a bet that constantly just compounds upon itself. I think that's a tricky thing for a lot of people to think about because it's not something that probably is brought up in the average high school or frankly, uh, most colleges. Not at all. And, I, you know, I try to, I, I mean, I actually think that this is a, I feel like this is a really sort of self-compassionate way to look at things, which is to your point, because everything is a bet. So we have bets that are compounding on each other. We have, we have this bet that occurs where we have to bet on whether something was because of luck or skill or what portion of it was luck or skill. So we can feed it back into the learning loop so that our beliefs can get updated better. So we can make a better bet going forward. So I think that one of the things that we really don't like to think about is that there's a lot of uncertainty out in the world, right? We don't really know what the future holds. We don't, we can't know with 100% certainty, whether the bet we made is, is the right bet. All we're trying to do is figure out what's the highest probability that I'm going to, you know, have a good outcome here. And none of it is ever 100% or 0%. And I think that that's very scary for people. You know, one of the things that I, I talk about in the, in the book is that we're very bad at saying, I'm not sure. I think partly because, you know, when you're in school, to your point of this not being taught in school, when we're in school, and if you put I'm not sure on a test answer, you would get it wrong, right? Which is too bad because we should be able to say I'm not sure, but here's what I do know and let me show you some of my work. I'm, I'm really not sure if this is right. And I think you should get extra credit for that because the fact is that if we're, if we were to model the world, I'm not sure is almost always the right answer to pretty much everything, right? Uh, is this the fastest way to get to the airport? Uh, the answer would be I'm not sure. It depends on traffic. I don't, I don't know whether there's going to be a, you know, semi that's turned over in the middle of the road. I don't know. I can tell you 
that in the past, given my past experiences, that this tends to be the fastest way to get to the airport. But I'm not sure today if it is. That would be a better answer for that, for example. But I'm like, when you say I don't know and you're comfortable with it, biologically, physiologically, there's a lot of good things happening inside of us. But that when you think you have to know, and this gets into a, a, a much extended conversation, but when you think you have to know, it's creating a stress that is unsolvable. I mean, it, it creates really bad things inside of us. I'm giving the quick and dirty version of what happens to us biologically, but it's true. I mean, we, it really creates a stress to think that you can know. You can't know. I think that a lot of the paralysis that people feel when they're making decisions is they think that they have to be certain. And it's really interesting because one of the questions I get is, well, if I approach the world from the standpoint of uncertainty, of saying, you know, hey, I'm, you know, I don't really know how it's going to turn out. I'm betting on it. They think, well, how do you ever make a decision then? And I said, well, that's exactly how you make a decision because you know that you can't be certain. And so you get much better at satisficing, right? As opposed to always trying to maximize, which is really hard to do when you, there's hidden information and luck, right? I think you're much more willing to say, okay, I've done my homework. I sort of figured out what I know. I've gone to the people around me who I trust who are of the right category to give me a good opinion. I've gotten their opinion to try to check my biases, to try to check my beliefs and update those as best as I can and really kind of run the decision by them. Uh, look, I think this is going to have the highest probability of working out. And now what's really wonderful is what you've wrapped into that is that you're uncertain. You think it's going to get you to the best place and you've, you've done your best work to get there. And now when it doesn't work out because you recognize that there was uncertainty in the first place, it doesn't feel so bad. And we don't put up those defensive walls now as much of, well, if it didn't work out, it must have been because of bad luck. Because we recognize that wrapped in to the decision was that all we were deciding on was a set of possible futures, not one sure and certain future. And among those set of possible futures, there were futures that didn't work out so well. So we kind of thought about that in advance. We wrap that into the decision, the bet that we made in advance. We aren't as likely to need to swat that away. It doesn't feel so bad to us because we thought about it beforehand. And when we have a good outcome, we aren't as likely to just sit there and go, well, let me bask in the glory of this because I'm so brilliant. Because the brilliance was already wrapped into the decision in the first place. And we knew that there was some possibility that that outcome was occurring. You're not a blue pill thinker. No, not at all. So now what you do is you, you can say like, look, okay, so now I had these outcomes. I knew that there was this possible set. Now let me go back and look and see, is there some way that I can improve this decision going forward? Was the good outcome more or less likely than maybe I thought it was? Was the bad outcome more or less likely than I thought it was now that I have this little bit of data here, right? Because the, the one data point doesn't tell us enough to make really big changes, but we can start to sort of refine based on that. Now, what's really lovely about that is not just that I think we're much less likely to be swatting these, these things away when they don't feel good or onboarding them when they do. We're much less likely to get emotionally distressed by a bad outcome because we've wrapped it into the decision process in the first place by thinking about it as a bad, which forces us to think about it as not certain. And that's really wonderful. But also it allows us to be actually more decisive. Um, and I think that that's the thing that scares people about bets the most is they, is they think, oh, this sounds like I'm, I'm just sort of like out there. What does that mean if I'm not certain? If I'm not certain that it's going to work out, it feels more like guessing. And it's like, here's the problem, though, is that you are already guessing because you can't be 100 percent certain of anything. That's completely impossible. So if you know that you already are guessing but you're walking through the world pretending like you're not, pretending like you have to be certain. Number one, you don't have an accurate view of the world, and that's bad, and that's going to degrade your decision quality. And number two, it's likely to cause you to be paralyzed because you feel like you have to get to certainty in order to actually bank a decision. You mentioned the betting scaring people, but I might add to it, I think it's the person making the bets that scares people. So if Annie Duke is making the bet... 
and perhaps people that don't have your experience or your grounding, your knowledge, they observe you making the bets. And let's say we're outside the poker world. We're just in the life world. The confidence that you have, the confidence that you show, and you're not necessarily, of course, there's not time to tell everybody why you're making such and such decision, what your process is. But I think that confidence is very scary for a lot of people that are not, they're not indoctrinated into to this thinking and bets uh, way of life. What's really interesting that you, you say confidence is that the, the confidence for me comes from the fact that I acknowledge that I don't know. That should hopefully help people feel better about it because honestly, like if I'm in a restaurant and I'm trying to decide between two dishes or I'm at a grocery store and I'm trying to decide between which line I'm going to get into, I know that's a bet, right? I'm just betting that line A is going to be faster than line B and I might be wrong. Right. I mean, not wrong in the sense of I made a poor bet. Right. Because I'm, I'm sort of looking at how many things are in the person's grocery cart and how fast does it look like the checker is. But I could just end up in a line that ends up slower, even though I've, I've gone through a good decision process. And I know that I know that I don't I don't know whether this line will be faster that I'm betting that it will be. I'm actually coming from a place of saying, well, I don't really know. All I'm trying to do is use my best judgment here and given what I do know and the presence of luck, trying to get myself to the best possible future. In that case, just being in the fastest grocery line. And the other thing that I recognize is that I never need to get anywhere near perfection in order to have this stuff worked out. We talked about this a little bit already. These things compound over time and very small changes will make a very big difference. So uh, if you think about it like this, you have some distribution of the quality of decisions that you make, right? And there's some decisions that are way out at the left tail. Those would be terrible, terrible decisions. Some decisions that are way out at the right tail, those are really excellent decisions. Um, and then you have, you know, sort of what your average looks like, right? What your average decision quality looks like. What we're really trying to do is just get more of our decisions out to the right tail, right? Maybe, maybe make the tails a little fatter. That would be good. But we're just trying to get more of our decisions to be out at the right tail. And then eventually, and I'll get to this, we're trying to shift the whole distribution, but let's just start with get more of our decisions out to the right tail. And I can do that through, for example, forming a really good decision group, right? If I form a really good decision group, then with their help, I can make sure that I'm executing more decisions that are at the right tail of my own distribution of whatever my distribution looks like. Now, when I do that, I only have to do that a little bit. I only have to make each decision marginally better than what my decision otherwise might have been because that creates a better probability that I'm going to have a good outcome that is then going to put me in a better position for the next decision that I have to make, which hopefully will be a little bit more to the right of my distribution, which will then create a marginally better um, chance that I have a good outcome and so on and so forth. And over your lifetime, just like compounding interest, right? That's going to create a much higher likelihood of having good outcomes in, in your lifetime. And the example that I give in the book really comes from poker, right? We have all of this feedback happening. So let's say that you have, I'm playing in a game and I have a hundred learning opportunities that got sort of dumped into my lap. And we know that it's a very noisy system. So I'm going to miss a lot of them. So let's say that if I'm sort of running on my own, left to my own devices without doing this work of thinking in bets, let's say that maybe I catch five out of the hundred learning opportunities, right? So I'm missing 95% of my chances to learn. I'm catching five of them. Okay. And now let's say that I do the hard work of thinking in bets. And what that gets me to is that I managed to now catch 10 of the learning opportunities as opposed to five. Now notice that I'm still missing 90% of the opportunities that are being dumped in my lap to learn. But I'm going to do a lot better. Annie, who is catching 10 of those learning opportunities, is going to do a hell of a lot better than Annie, who is catching five of those learning opportunities. The outcomes for Annie, who catches 10, are going to be much better because those are going to compound over time. So think about how really wonderful it is to think in bets. Because if you're not thinking of bets, if you're thinking from a standpoint of certainty and not catching all hundred of those learning opportunities is considered failure. But by thinking of bets and understanding that we're just in this noisy system, sort of trying to do the best that we can to hurdle ourselves to the most likely good outcome that we, we can find, then Annie, who's only catching 10, is now a huge success because I'm doing better than I was before. Let me go out on a limb here with you, and I, I think you can comment on this because I know you've done the homework, some of your research and study, but I think the this quest for certainty 
I would guess that for a certain number of people in the population that really get down and perhaps suffer from depression, I would suspect some of it comes from this incorrect view that they are supposed to navigate life in this certain way and that there is perfection. Whereas if someone's listening to you talk in this conversation with an open mind, they're saying, well, she seems very comfortable not knowing. Yeah, I think that that's true. And I, I think that if somebody looked at a particular type of therapy, like say cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, I think that some of these concepts are really wrapped into that. Um, this idea that we shouldn't be overgeneralizing, that we don't, we can't know for certain how things are going to work out. You know, that you, you can't possibly, you can't possibly achieve certainty that when things work out, don't work out, it's not necessarily your fault. But what has to go along with that is that sometimes it is. I mean, in the sense of sometimes there are decisions that can be improved and sometimes the good stuff isn't because you're such a genius and sometimes it is. So you're approaching your outcomes from a much more neutral stance. You're, you're approaching your outcomes in, in a much less emotionally charged way where what you recognize is that a single outcome really doesn't have a lot to say about what your life narrative should look like, whether that, that narrative of your, of your life is positive or negative, whether you're smart, whether you're um, a good actor, whether you're a good decision maker. Sort of in the same sense of what Phil Ivey did, you can kind of think about it as uh, viewing your life's outcome more from the standpoint of, as an observer, as to someone who is so incredibly emotionally invested in every single thing that happens to you. Because once you step back and you're sort of observing your outcomes in the sense of, okay, well, so this stuff happened. I recognized that I was betting in the first place. I, I, you know, obviously I was uncertain because by definition I am. It's an accurate representation of the world to say that there's uncertainty. And all I was doing was trying to get myself to the best possible future. So now this outcome has occurred and let me observe that and try to figure out what was luck, what was skill. Notice that, that the emotional charge isn't there anymore, right? We can... Uh, and there's a lot more self-compassion that comes from that because we aren't getting yanked around by the momentary fluctuations, right? We, we, it allows us to step back and I think view our lives more like a happiness stock, right? Where we're playing for the long run. And what we're really trying to do is get a, a positive slope. And certainly if we drill down and we, we take a zoom lens onto what that, that function looks like as we look at that happiness stock, we're going to see these momentary fluctuations, right? As we have individual outcomes, things are going to, you know, things are going to fluctuate up and fluctuate down and fluctuate up and fluctuate down. But we know that we're, when we're investing in a stock for the long run, where we're, we're taking a, a long position, a long-term position, all we're looking for is a positive slope. And what happens at 1130 on a Tuesday is pretty irrelevant. And if we can get to that place where we're thinking about our lives that way, where, where we're not being yanked around in the moment all the time, it's just going to create a lot more happiness for us. It's going to make us a lot calmer, a lot less hard on ourselves. You know, with all your wisdom, though, that you're putting in these pages, it's up against a world that's in love with social media, which is just pushing the exact opposite of where you're pushing. I think that you can be very smart about the way that you approach social, social media by approaching it as a way actually to execute on what John Haidt said, which is expose yourself to the clash of ideas in the public square. I think that it's really bad if you're on social media and you're only following people that you agree with. That, that's not to say that you should necessarily be following people who are at the extreme. I'm not asking you to dive yourself into the most extreme subreddit that you've ever seen. Although taking a look at that occasionally is actually quite helpful just for you, for you to understand that those worlds exist and, and you should kind of understand the thinking of that. But it would be really good if everybody went and looked at their Twitter, for example, and saw if, say, they're liberal, am I only following people with liberal opinions or am I following some people with conservative opinions? If you're a conservative, are you following people with liberal opinions? And you can really do that about anything, right? I mean, obviously, as you know, there's all sorts of different theories in investing. There's There are people who are really pro-Bitcoin or people who are anti-Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, you know, and you should make sure that you have a slate. Now, obviously, you want to get the more thoughtful people from each slate, but I actually, that's the way that I use social media. I would argue that if you were to look at my social media, it would be very difficult for you to figure out whether I was a Republican or a Democrat. And that is by uh, design and choice. 
Um, because I think it's really, really, really important for me to be seeing both sides of any argument that, that I want to be thinking about. I could not agree anymore. I know sometimes in the past I've perhaps put strong views out on things, but often I'll go back and just delete something if it was too, too over the top. But then I will see, even in my Twitter feed, I will see certain individuals very well known and they will put partisan positions out on both sides, different people all the time. And I, it just looks tiring to me. <laughs> it just, it's, I, I agree. And what, one of the things I like to do, so I have a newsletter that uh, goes out every Friday, hopefully every Friday. It has so far every Friday, but you know, uh, I'm not certain. Let me just say that. I'm not certain it will be every single Friday, but so far, so good. People can subscribe to that if they want to by going over to AnnieDuke.com. But one of the things that I'll very often do is I'll, I'll talk about a particular thing that's happened in current events, and I'll just point people to articles that are taking different positions on it and say, go read this slate of articles. Here here are these people. They're, they're on this side of the argument. Here are these people. They're on that side of the argument. You know, just just go take a look at what people are arguing on both sides. My newsletter is really taking this kind of approach that you see in the book um, and uh, and applying it to current events that, you know, are, are happening, you know, that week or in the, in the past few weeks before I put the newsletter out. And, you know, I, I what a lot of what I'm doing is just pointing people to opposing positions so that they can go read for themselves what a sane person on one side is saying and what a sane person on, on the other side of the argument is saying. Um, cause I, I think it's really important to understand, like one of the things I say is if you, if you have two people who are equally informed, who hold opposing, but very, very extreme positions on some topic and they're equally informed people, we know that the answer has to be somewhere in the middle. We just know that by definition, right? I mean, if you think about it mathematically, I think it's really important to be looking at that so that you can start to, to get a more moderated view of the world. Because the extreme of something is almost never true. The only way that the extreme opinion could be true, let's say we disagree and I hold a very extreme opinion and you don't, is that I have all the information and you have zero. Right? Now, now we can assume that, that, my, that it's going to be much closer to what my view is in terms of what the actual truth is, what the objective truth is. But when you have two people who are equally informed clashing in that way, we know that objectively speaking, just from a mathematical standpoint, the answer is going to lie somewhere in the middle. And the problem is that if you're only reading the person on one side, you're actually, your opinion will become radicalized because they are going to present an argument that sounds very logical. They're going to present an argument that has lots of facts. That's that spin problem. How are you slicing and dicing the data? Right. And you're, when you're looking at that one person who's extreme on one side, who's smart and informed slicing and dicing the data, they will be very convincing, particularly if you already agree with them. And you will then become much more extreme in your opinion. And now when you go with an open mind and you see someone on the other side of the issue, slicing and dicing that data and offering a very logical and well thought out view of the exact same topic, you naturally will become more moderated. And that's just a more accurate view of the world. I feel so lucky to do this podcast. You know, that's my outlet. It's my way to, uh, to reach out there and, and get all these different voices ideas, thoughts, et cetera, to come into my brain. Thinking in Bets, the new book, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. I'll paint a picture for people out there to imagine where this book would fit on their shelf. If you have Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, if you have Phil Tetlock's Super Forecasting, it's in the same headspace. I think you will thoroughly enjoy it. I think it's, it's and of course, with Annie, you're, you're bringing a, a different perspective with poker and bringing different ideas in through that avenue. So I think it's right there in that, in that headspace. And you probably by design, I'm guessing a little bit. I think absolutely by design. Uh, Phil Tetlock is very heavily cited in the book, as you know. Kahneman is very heavily cited. Dan Ariely with uh, Predictably Irrational gets a shout out. Another person I, I just want to mention because I think he's so important to this topic about luck and skill is Michael Matheson. Mm, great. Uh, you know, I point people in the, the direction of the success equation. I, I, you should have him on the show, by the way, if you haven't. I don't know if you have or not. He has already been on twice. He actually appeared on my film years ago. He is the best. He's awesome. <laughs> he, he is so great. And he, he speaks really just so eloquently and so insightfully uh, about this issue of luck and skill that, you know, has a, a pretty prominent place in my book. But I do make the point that, you know, if you want a much fuller discussion about it, you should go look at what his work is, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm really thinking in that same space, you know, as, as what John Hyde and, and Tetlock and 
um, Kahneman and Ariely and that kind of thing. From this perspective, I think of having really been in this natural lab to your point. And, and now looking back on my life saying how lucky, right? How lucky that I got sick. So I had to take that year off. I had to wait till the next season of job talks. And it's, it's kind of funny because I, I spent a lot of time, I think, beating myself up about that one. You know, oh, should I become an academic? I don't know. Like, I feel like I sort of, you know, quit right at the end, you know, but I now consider myself so lucky to be able to take the same kind of work that fits in that same space and bring the experience of having, you know, been in this natural laboratory for, for how you make decisions under conditions of uncertainty for so many years and, and really see what the natural behaviors of humans are under those conditions. And I'm just very grateful for, for those experiences. I mean, to take all the names that we just mentioned, to take this direction that you went with poker, you know, if I'm just a guy kind of looking at somebody, looking at your career, you have built a nice moat around you. It's going to be hard for someone to penetrate that moat and say, oh, I'm just like Annie. It's going to be kind of tough, you know? Maybe your brother could compete with you, you know? <laughs> well, my, well, sadly, my brother doesn't have the academic background, so I have that mode around me, too. But, yes, my, my brother could certainly compete with me about uh, in terms of talking about poker. And I just want to say, like, look, the people that you're talking about are, are my heroes, and they are giants in this space that I think in. And the fact that you would say to anybody, certainly the listeners of your podcast, that my book might be able to sit right next to theirs is incredibly kind. Well, we, we know the content. I mean, I've got the, I've got the book in my hands and uh, you guys were kind enough to ship me two to Asia. I got it from, I think from, from multiple sources, but look, the content, we, you and I know the content and it is in that same headspace. And you do bring this unique take with the poker perspective. And it's by no means are you putting poker on every page either. It's quite, it's actually, it's quite different than probably our, our prior conversations where we did talk more poker. The book is, is very uh, varied and wide. Yeah. It's, it's just, just I, so people aren't scared of the book. It's very poker like actually. Um, there's a few fun stories from the poker world that I think that people will enjoy, uh, including one which involves somebody moving to Des Moines on a bet which I think is hilarious, but mostly it's just setting up this idea that, that, uh, poker informs decision-making in a way that say chess doesn't because you have this hidden information problem. Um, and so it can inform decision-making in life in, in a different way. Uh, you don't need to have ever played a hand of poker in order to really get something out of the book. I just want to make that really clear. I, I really appreciate your enthusiasm for the book. And I'm, I'm hoping that other people will um, find the, the same enthusiasm for it that you have. It, it makes me feel really good. And I, I appreciate it. AnnieDuke.com, right? The book is going to be on Amazon, uh, all those fun places, easily found. Annie, you will probably do number two. I tell this to people when they come on the show and they talk about their first book. And I think sometimes people say, no, but I'm just telling you, I just sneaky suspicion. Well, I will, I'll tell you. So, so the book that's coming out is out February 6th. I'm really excited about And I will tell you that I am actually working on a, a meeting with my agent who I just want to give a shout out to my agent, Jim Levine, who is absolutely the loveliest person in the world and has been incredible to work with. I mean, I have had such a good experience writing this book, both with my agent and my publisher. And, you know, I've heard people not have such good experiences in those spaces. So I just want to give a shout out that it has been a dream to work with everybody involved in this book. I, I'm so grateful to them. And I am going to talk to him about my my next endeavor, because I've already started to think about what the next book might look like, mainly because I feel like in writing this book, there was just naturally a lot of stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor or things that I handled in a light way that I feel like could have really been blown out into something big. So we'll see. We'll see. I'm not I'm not there yet, but I am already exploring. So I predict that your prediction is at least partially true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I tell you what, the, the, the blowing it out idea, my first book came out in 04, it was around 80,000 words. The next edition got it up to like 100,000 words. I did a fifth edition of that book in 2017. It got up to 220,000 words, basically a textbook. They might not feel natural to go that heavy, but with the topics that you're in the middle of, I guarantee the audience would jump there. Well, you know, we'll see. I hope so. I mean, I would, I would, I would handle it not as blowing it up this particular book, but another, creating another book that's a companion. I tell people is that I, I just, gosh, I love what I do. And I love the stuff that I think about. 
And I, I have some sort of conversations about it every single day because it's really what lights me up inside intellectually. I want to keep getting lit up inside. What this book has done for me is, is allowed me to explore it in a way that's more deep and immersive than the other kinds of things that I do, which are the keynoting and the corporate retreats and the consulting where I'm coming in, I'm doing it. And then, you know, I'm going back home and certainly I'm thinking about it at other times, but a book forces you into such an immersive and deep dive experience. If it's what energizes you of thinking in that the space energizes you, what, a, what an amazing experience to have. And um, I'm, I want more of it. I want, I want more of that. Congratulations. Hopefully we will talk again when the next one comes. Again, the book, Thinking in Bats, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. And guess what? You don't have all the facts. Annie Duke. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love Annie. I'm sure she's working on another book. I will aim to get her on this podcast when she releases it. But in the meantime, as promised in the intro, let's jump right into a little Charlie Munger and a little Warren Buffett for that timeless wisdom that we all need for this holiday season, 2019. Today, I want to feature two survivors, two guys that have been around a long time, making an absolute boatload, train full of money, wealthy as they can be, super successful. They're not trend following traders in a sense of how I would define trend following by any stretch of the imagination. However, they are very keen about risk management position sizing, and all those really, really core things for great, successful investing trading. Today, I want to feature two speeches, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. They don't need much introduction. Now, I've gone on record over the years with some criticism. I will restate that criticism now. Mr. Munger and Mr. Buffett, while super successful, perform a type of strategy that you can't. They're the biggest, baddest guys on the block. They trade massive derivative positions, things that we won't understand, things that only happen when you are at their level and you can coordinate with Goldman Sachs. I don't like what happened in the fall of 2008. Clearly, they used power advantages to make great deals. I don't like it in the sense that the meme is still out there, that you too can be Buffett. You too can be a value investor. Anyone that watched the fall of 2008 knows that Warren Buffett held the gold and he made the rules. More power to him we would all probably do the same damn thing. If the world is going to hell in a handbasket and you've got the money and you've got the power and you can make deals to make yourself a fortune and arguably help the greater economy, you do it all day long. But that's not me. That's not you. And you can find across the spectrum inconsistencies and hypocrisies in Mr. Buffett's public statements. But when it comes to measuring his success, 
politics aside, because he does have a certain political view that half of the world will agree with and half of the world will not agree with. That aside, the ultimate measuring stick, money. Can he make money? Has he done it generally in a fair, ethical way? I think most people would agree he has. And he's made a bloody fortune. He deserves every bit of respect for that. The question, the big question though, can you employ his strategy? Very, very difficult. But this podcast today isn't really about strategy as much as it is about mindset, the right way to think. Because there is a tremendous value that we can all take away from the thinking process of Charlie Munger, the thinking process of Warren Buffett. They're clear. Now again, even if we can't employ their exact strategy because we're not them and we don't have that kind of power, we can take their philosophical foundations and apply it to a better money-making strategy for our own accounts. Absolutely, 100%. All those disclaimers aside, I want to play an initial presentation from the mid-1990s, Charlie Munger, well over 20 years ago. Timeless? You bet. Well, I am very interested in the subject of human misjudgment, and Lord knows I've created my, well, a good bit of it. I don't think... I've created my full statistical share. I think that one of the reasons was that I tried to do something about this terrible ignorance I left the Harvard Law School with when I saw this patterned irrationality, which was so extreme, and I had no theory or anything to, to, to deal with it, but I could see that it was extreme and I could see that it was patterned. I just started to create my own system of psychology uh, partly by casual reading, but largely from personal experience. And I used that pattern to help me get through life. Fairly late in life, I stumbled into this book, Influence, by a psychologist named Bob Cialdini, who became a super tenured hotshot and a 2,000 person faculty at a very young age. Uh, and he wrote this book, which has now sold 300 odd thousand copies, which is remarkable for uh, semi, well, it's an academic book aimed at a popular audience. And that filled in a lot of holes in my crude system. And uh, when those holes had, had filled in, I, uh, I thought I had a system that was a good working tool, and I'd like to uh, share that one with you. And I came here because behavioral economics, how could economics not be behavioral? If it isn't behavioral, what the hell is it? Uh, and uh, I think it's fairly clear that all reality has to respect all other reality. If you come to inconsistencies, they have to be resolved. So the idea of if there's anything valid in psychology, economics has to recognize it and, and vice versa. So I think the people that are working on this fringe between economics and, and, psychology, and psychology are are absolutely right to be there, and I think there's been plenty wrong over the years. Well, let me romp through my as much of this list as I have time to get through. 24 standard causes of, of human misjudgment. <laughs> First, under recognition of the power of what psychologists call reinforcement, and, economic, and economists call incentives. Well, you can say everybody knows that. Well, I think I've been in the top 5% of my age cohort all my life in understanding the power of incentives, and all my life I've underestimated it. And never a year passes but when I get some surprise that pushes, pushes my limit a little farther. So one of my favorite cases about the power of incentives it, power of incentives is the Federal Express case, where heart and soul of the integrity of the system is that all the packages have to be shipped rapidly in one central location each night. And the system has no integrity if the whole shift can't be done fast. And Federal Express had one hell of a time getting the thing to work. And they tried moral suasion, they tried everything in the world, 
And finally somebody got the happy thought that they were paying the night shift by the hour. And that maybe if they paid them by the shift, the system would work better. And lo and behold, that solution worked. Early in the history of Xerox, Joe Wilson, who was then in the government, had to go back to Xerox because he couldn't understand how their better new machine was selling so poorly in relation to their older and inferior machine. Of course, when he got there, he found out that the commission arrangement with the salesman gave a tremendous incentive to the inferior machine. And uh, here at Harvard, in the shadow of B.F. Skinner, uh, uh, there was a man who really was in the reinforcement as a powerful uh, as a powerful thought and you know Skinner has lost his reputation in a lot of places but if you were to analyze the entire history of experimental science at Harvard he'd be in the top handful his experiments were very ingenious the results were counterintuitive and they were important it is not given to experimental science to do better. What gummed up Skinner's reputation is that he developed a case of what I always call man with a hammer syndrome. To the man with a hammer, every problem tends to look pretty much like a nail. And, and Skinner had one of the more extreme cases in the history of academia. And this syndrome doesn't exempt bright people. It's just a man with a hammer. And Skinner is an extreme example of that. And uh, later, as I go down my list, let's go back and try and figure out why people like Skinner get man with a hammer syndrome. Incidentally, when I was at the Harvard Law School, there was a professor, naturally at Yale, who uh, was derisively discussed at Harvard. And they used to say, poor old Blanchard. He thinks declaratory judgments will cure cancer. And, and that's the way Skinner got. And not only that, he got very, uh, he was literary. And he scorned opponents who had any different way of thinking or thought anything else was important. This is not a way to make a lasting reputation if the other people turn out to also be doing something important. My second factor is simple psychological denial. This first really hit me between the eyes when a friend of our family had a super athlete, super student son who flew off a carrier in the North Atlantic and never came back. And his mother, who had was a very sane woman, just never believed it. he was dead. And of course, if you turn on the television, you find the mothers of the most obvious criminals that a man could ever diagnose, and they all think their sons are innocent. Uh, simple psychological denial. The reality is too too painful to bear, so you just distort it until it's bearable. We all do that to some extent, and uh, it's a common psychological misjudgment that causes terrible problems. Third, incentive-caused bias, both in one's own mind and that of one's trusted advisor, where it creates what economists call agency costs. Here, my early experience was a doctor who sent bushel baskets full of normal gallbladders down to the pathology lab in a leading hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska. And with that quality control for which community hospitals are famous, about five years after he should have been removed from the staff, he was. The, one of the old doctors who participated in the removal was also a family friend, and I asked him, I said, tell me, did he think here's a way for me to exercise my talents? This guy was very skilled, technically, and, and make a high living by doing a few maimings and murders every year, along with some frauds. And he said, hell no, Charlie. He thought that the gallbladder was the source of all medical evil, and that if you really loved your patients, you couldn't get that organ out rapidly enough. Uh, now, that's an extreme case, but in lesser strength, it's present in, in, in every profession and in every human being. And uh, it causes perfectly terrible behavior. If you take sales presentations of brokers of commercial real estate and business, businesses. I'm 70 years old. I've never seen one I thought was even within hailing distance of objective truth. <laughs> if you want to talk about the power of incentives and the power to rationalize terrible behavior, after the Defense Department had had enough experience with cost plus percentage of cost contracts, the reaction of our republic was to make it a crime for the federal government to write one. And not only a crime, but a felony. 
And, uh, and by the way, the government's right. But a lot of the way the world is run, including most law firms and a lot of other places, they've still got a cost plus percentage of cost system. And human nature, with its version of what I call incentive caused bias, causes this terrible abuse. And many of the people who are doing it, you would be glad to have marry into your family compared to what you're otherwise going to get. <laughs> now, there are huge implications from, from, from the fact that human mind is, is put together this way. And that is that people who create things like cash registers, which make misbehavior hard, are some of the effective saints of our civilization. And the cash register was a great moral instrument when it was created. And Patterson knew that, by the way. He had a little store, and the people were stealing him blind and never made any money, and people sold him a couple of cash registers, and it went to profit immediately. And, of course, he closed the store and went into the cash register business <laughs> with results which are... are and so this is a huge important thing. If you read the psychology text, you will find that if they're a thousand pages long, there's one sentence. Somehow incentive caused bias has escaped the standard survey course in psychology. Fourth, and this is a superpower in error causing psychological tendency, bias from consistency and commitment tendency, including the tendency to avoid or promptly resolve cognitive dissonance, includes the self-confirmation tendency of all conclusions, particularly expressed conclusions and with a special persistence for conclusions that are hard won. But what I'm saying here is that the human mind is a lot like the human egg, and the human egg has a shut-off device. Woman's sperm gets in, it shuts down, so the next one can't get in. The human mind has a big tendency of the same sort. And here again, it doesn't just catch ordinary mortals, it catches the deans of physics. According to Max Planck, the really innovative, important new physics was never really accepted by the old guard. Instead, a new guard came along that was less brain blocked by its previous conclusions. And if Max Planck's crowd had this consistency and commitment tendency that kept their old conclusions intact in spite of disconfirming evidence, you can imagine what the crowd that you and I are part of behaves like. Uh, and of course, if you make a public disclosure of your conclusion, you're pounding it in to your own head. Many of these students that are screaming at us, you know, they aren't convincing us, but they're, they're forming mental chains for themselves because what they're shouting out, they're pounding in. And, uh, and I think educational institutions that create a climate where too much of that goes on are, uh, in a fundamental sense, they're irresponsible institutions. It's very important to not put your brain in chains too young by what you shout out. And all these things like painful qualifying and initiation rituals, and all those things pound in your, your commitments and your ideas. And uh, the Chinese brainwashing system, which was for war prisoners, which was way better than anybody else's, they maneuvered people into making tiny little commitments and declarations, and then they'd slowly build. That worked way better than torture. Uh, sixth, bias from Pavlovian association, misconstruing past correlation as a re reliable basis for decision making. I never took a course in psychology or economics either for that matter, but I did learn about Pavlov in high school biology. And uh, the way they taught it, you know, so the dog salivated when the bell rang, so what? You know, it, nobody made the least effort to tie that to the wide world. Well, the truth of the matter is that Pavlovian association is an enormously powerful psychological force in the daily life of all of us. And indeed, in economics, uh, we wouldn't have money without the role of so-called secondary reinforcement, which is a pure psychological uh, uh, phenomenon demonstrated in the, in the laboratory. Practically, well, I'd say three-quarters of advertising works on pure Pavlov. I mean, think how association, pure association works. Take Coca-Cola Company, where we're the biggest shareholder. They want to be associated with every wonderful image, heroics in the Olympics, wonderful music, you name it. They don't want to be associated with presidents' funerals and so forth. When have you seen a Coca-Cola <laughs> ad? And the, the association really works. And 
all these psychological tendencies work largely or entirely at a, on a subconscious level, which, is, which makes them very insidious. Then you've got Persian messenger syndrome. The Persians really did kill the messenger who brought the bad news. You think that is dead? I mean, you should have seen Bill Paley in his last 20 years. He didn't hear one damn thing he didn't want to hear. People knew that it, that it, that it was bad for the messenger to, to, to bring Bill Paley things he didn't want to hear. Well, that means that the leader gets in a cocoon of unreality. And it's a great big enterprise, and boy, did he make some dumb decisions in the last 20 years. Uh, no, Persian mes messenger syndrome is alive and well. When I saw some years ago Arco and Exxon arguing over a few hundred millions of ambiguity in their North Slope treaties before a superior court judge in Texas with armies of lawyers and experts on each side, now, this is a Mad Hatter's Tea Party. Two engineering-style companies can't resolve some ambiguity without spending tens of millions of dollars in some Texas Superior Court. In my opinion, what happens is that nobody wants to bring the bad news to the executives up the line, that here's a few hundred million dollars you thought you had that you don't, and it's much safer to act like the Persian messenger who goes away to hide rather than bring home the news of the battle lost. Talking about economics, you get a very interesting phenomenon that I've seen over and over again in a long life. You've got two products. Suppose they're complex technical product. Now you think under the laws of economics that if product A costs X, if product Y costs X minus something, it will sell better than if it sells at X plus something. But that's not so. In many cases, when you raise the price of the alternative product, it'll get a larger market share than it would when you make it lower than your competitor's product. That's because the bell, the Pavlovian bell, I mean, ordinarily there's a correlation between price and value. You have an information and efficiency. And so when you raise the price, the sales go up relative to your competitor. That happens again and again and again. It's a pure Pavlovian phenomenon, and and uh, and you can say, well, the economists have figured this sort of thing out when they started talking about information inefficiencies. But that was fairly late in economics that they found such an obvious thing. And of course, most of them don't ask what causes the information inefficiencies. Well, one of the things that causes it is pure old Pavlov and his dog. Now you've got bias from Skinnerian Association, operant conditioning, you know, where you give the dog a reward and 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 pound in the behavior that uh, preceded the dogs getting the award. And of course, Skinner was able to create superstitious pigeons by having rewards come, you know, by accident with certain occurrences. And of course, we all know people who are the human equivalents of superstitious pigeons. That's a very powerful phenomenon. And of course, operant conditioning really works. I mean, the people in the center who think that operant conditioning is is important are, are, are very much right. It's just that the Skinner overdid it a little. Where you see in business just perfectly horrible results from psychological, psychologically rooted tendencies is in accounting. If you take Westinghouse, which blew, what, two or three billion dollars pre-tax at least, loaning developers to build hotels and virtually 100% loans. Now you say any idiot knows that there's one thing you don't like, it's a developer, and another you don't like, it's a hotel. And to make a 100% <laughs> loan to a developer is going to build a hotel. But, but this guy, he, he probably was an engineer or something, and he didn't take psychology anymore than I did. And, he got out there in the hands of these slick salesmen operating under their version of incentive cost bias, where any damn way of getting Westinghouse to do it was considered normal business, and they just blew it. That would never have been possible if the accounting system hadn't been such that for the initial phase of every transaction, it showed wonderful financial results. So people who have loose accounting standards are just inviting perfectly horrible behavior in other people, uh, and it's a sin. It's an absolute sin to, 
if you carried bushel baskets full of money through the ghetto and made, them, made it easy to steal, that would be a considerable human sin because you'd be causing a lot of bad behavior and the bad behavior w would spread. Similarly, an institution that gets sloppy accounting uh, commits a, a real human sin and it's also a dumb way to do business as Westinghouse has so wonderfully proved. Oddly enough, nobody mentions, at least nobody I've seen, what happened with Joe Jett and Kidder Peabody. The truth of the matter is the accounting system was such that by punching a few buttons, the Joe Jets of the world could show profits and profits that showed up and things that resulted in rewards and esteem and every other thing that human being. Well, the Joe Jets are always with us, and they're not really to blame, in my judgment at least. But that bastard who, who created that foolish accounting system, who so far as I know has not been played alive, <laughs> ought to be. Seventh, bias from reciprocation tendency, including the tendency of one in a role to act as other persons expect. Well, here again, Cialdini does a magnificent job at this, and you're all going to be given a copy of Cialdini's book, and if you have half as much sense as I think you do, you will immediately order copies for all of your children and several of your friends. You will never make a better investment. It is so easy to be a patsy for what he calls the compliance practitioners of this life. And, uh, but at any rate, reciprocation tendency is a very, very powerful phenomenon. And Cialdini demonstrated this by running around a campus. And he asked people to, to take juvenile delinquents to the zoo. And it was a campus, and so one and six actually agreed to do it. And, uh, and after he'd accumulated the statistical output, he went around on the same campus, and he asked other people, he said, gee, would you devote two afternoons a week to taking juvenile delinquents somewhere and suffering great yourself to help them and there he got 100% of the people to say no but after he made the first request he backed off a little and he said well would you at least take them to the zoo one afternoon he raised the compliance rate from a third to a half he got three times the success by just going through the little ask for a lot and back off now if the human mind on a subconscious level can be manipulated that way and you don't know it well, I always use the phrase, you're like a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. I mean, you are, I mean, you are really giving a lot of quarter to the external world that you, you, you can't afford to give. On this so-called role theory where you tend to act in the way that other people expect, that's reciprocation if you think about the way society is organized. And a guy named Zimbardo had people at Stanford divide into two pieces, one were the guards and the other were the prisoners, and they started acting out roles as people expected. He had to stop the experiment after about five days. He was getting into human misery and breakdown and pathological behavior. I mean, it was, it was, it was awesome. However, Tim Bardo is greatly misinterpreted. It's not just reciprocation tendency and role theory that caused that. It's consistency and commitment tendency. Each person, as he acted as a guard or a prisoner, the action itself was pounding in the idea. Wherever you turn, this consistency and commitment tendency is, is affecting you. In other words, what you think may change what you do, but perhaps even more important, what you do will change what you think. And you can say everybody knows that. I want to tell you I didn't know it well enough early enough. Eight. Now this is a Lollapalooza, and Henry Kaufman wisely talked about this. Bias from over-influence by social proof, that is, the conclusions of others, particularly under conditions of natural uncertainty and stress. And here, one of the cases the psychologist used is Kitty Genovese, where all these people, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 of them, just sort of sat and did nothing while she was slowly murdered. And now, one of the explanations is that everybody looked at everybody else and nobody else was doing anything, and so there's automatic social proof that the right thing to do is nothing. That's not a good enough explanation for Kitty Genovese, in my judgment. That's only part of it. 
There are microeconomic ideas in gain loss ratios and so forth that also come into play. I think time and time again in reality, psychological notions and economic notions interplay. And the man who doesn't understand both is a damn fool. Big shot businessmen get into these waves of social proof. Do you remember some years ago when one oil company bought a fertilizer company? And every other major oil company practically ran out and bought a fertilizer company. And there was no more damn reason for all these oil companies to buy fertilizer companies. But they didn't know exactly what to do. And if Exxon was doing it, it was good enough for Mobil or vice versa. And of course, the, I think they're all gone now. It was a total disaster. Now let's talk about efficient market theory, a wonderful economic doctrine that had a long vogue in spite of the experience of Berkshire Hathaway. In fact, one of the economists who won, he shared a Nobel Prize. And as he looked at Berkshire Hathaway year after year, which people would throw in his face as saying, maybe the market isn't quite as efficient as you think, he said, well, it's a two-sigma event. And then he said, we were a three-sigma event. And then he said, we were a four-sigma event. And he finally got up to six sigmas. Better to add a sigma than change a theory, just because the <laughs> evidence comes in differently. And of course, when this share of a Nobel Prize went into money management himself, he sank like a stone. <laughs> if, you, if you think about the doctrines I've talked about, namely one, the power of reinforcement. After all, you do something and the market goes up and you get paid and rewarded and applauded and what have you. You're getting a lot of reinforcement if you make a bet in a market and the market goes with you. Also, there's social proof. I mean, the, the prices in the market are the ultimate form of social proof, reflecting what other people think. And so the combination is very powerful. Why would you expect general market levels to always be totally efficient, say even in 1973, 4 at the pit, or in 1972 or whatever it was when the Nifty 50 were in their heyday? Uh, if these psychological notions are correct, you would affect you would expect some waves of irrationality, which, which carry general levels to, to, uh, to uh, so they're inconsistent with, with, with reason. Nine, what made these economists love the efficient market theory is the math was so elegant. And after all, math was what they'd learned to do. The man with a hammer, every problem tends to look pretty much like a nail. The alternative truth was a little messy. And they'd forgotten the great economist Keynes, whom I think said, better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. Nine, bias from contrast caused distortions of sensation, perception, and cognition. Here, the great experiment that Cialdini does in his class is he takes three buckets of water. One's hot, one's cold, and one's room temperature. And he has the student stick his left hand in the hot water and his right hand in the cold water. Then he has them remove the hands and put them both in the room temperature bucket. And of course, with both hands in the same bucket of water, one seems hot and the other seems cold because the sensation apparatus of man is over-influenced by contrast. It has no absolute scale. It's got a contrast scale in it. And it's a scale with quantum effects in it, too. It takes a certain percentage change before it's noticed. Maybe you've had a magician remove your watch. I certainly have without your noticing it. It's the same thing. He's taken, taking advantage of your, uh, of your, of contrast type troubles in your sensory apparatus. But here the great truth is that cognition mimics sensation. And the cognition ma manipulators mimic the watch-removing remo magician. In other words, people are manipulating you all day long on this contrast phenomenon. Cialdini cites the case of the real estate broker, and you've got the rube that's been transferred into your town. And the first thing you do is you take the rube out to the two of the most awful overpriced houses you've ever seen. And then you take the rube to some moderately overpriced house and then you stick them and it, it works pretty well which is why the real estate salesmen do it it's always going to work and the accidents of life can can do this to you and it can ruin your life in my generation when women lived at home until they got married 
I saw some perfectly terrible marriages made by, by highly desirable women because they lived in terrible homes. And, uh, and I've seen some terrible second marriages which were made because there were slight improvements over an even worse first marriage. <laughs> and you think you're immune from these things and you laugh and I want to tell you you aren't. And the, uh, my favorite analogy I can't vouch for the accuracy of. I have this worthless friend I like to play bridge with and he's a total intellectual amateur that lives on inherited money. But he told me once something I really enjoyed hearing. He said, Charlie, he says, if you throw a frog into very hot water, the frog will jump out. But if you put the frog in room temperature water and just slowly heat the water up, the frog will die there. Now, I don't know whether that's true about a frog, but it sure as hell true about many of the businessmen I know. And there again, it is the... It is the contrast phenomena. These are hotshot, high-powered people. I mean, these are not <laughs> fools. If it comes to you in small pieces, you're likely to miss. So you have to, if you're going to be a person of good judgment, you have to do something about this warp in your head where it's so misled by, by mere contrast. Bias from over-influence by authority. Well, here are the Milgram experiment, as it's caused. I think there have been 1,600 psychological papers written about Milgram. And he had a person posing as an authority figure trick ordinary people into giving what they had every reason to expect was heavy torture by electric shock to perfectly innocent fellow citizens. And the experiment has been, he was trying to show that why Hitler succeeded and a few other things. And uh, and uh, so this really caught the fancy of the world. Partly it's so politically correct. Over-influenced by authority has another very, you, this will, you'll like this one. You got a pilot and a co-pilot. The pilot is the authority figure. They don't do this in airplanes, but they've done it in simulators. They have the pilot do something where the co-pilot, who's been trained in simulators a long time, he knows he's not to allow the plane to crash. They have the pilot to do something where an idiot co-pilot would know the plane was going to crash, but the pilot's doing it and the co-pilot is sitting there and the pilot is the authority figure. 25% of the time the plane crashes. I mean, this is a very powerful psychological tendency. It's not quite as powerful as some people think, and I'll get to that later. Eleven, bias from deprival super reaction syndrome, including bias caused by present or threatened scarcity, including threatened removal of something almost possessed but never possessed. Here I took the Munger dog, Not lovely, harmless dog. The one way, the only way to get that dog to bite you was to try and take something out of its mouth after it was already there. And any of you who have tried to do takeaways in labor negotiations will know that the human version of that dog is there in all of us. I have a neighbor, a neighbor, a predecessor on a little island where I have a house, and his next door neighbor put a little pine tree in that was about three feet high, and it turned his 180 degree view of the harbor into 179 and three quarters. Well, they had a blood feud like the Hatfields and McCoys, and it went on and on and on. And I mean, people are really crazy about minor decrements down. And then, if you act on them, you get into reciprocation tendency, because you don't just reciprocate affection, you reciprocate animosity, and the whole thing can escalate. And so, huge insanities can come from, from just subconsciously overweighing the importance of what you're losing or almost getting and not getting. The extreme business case here was New Coke. Now Coca-Cola has the most valuable trademark in the world. We're the major shareholder. I mean, we, I think we understand that trademark. Coke has armies of brilliant engineers, lawyers, psychologists, advertising executives, and so forth. And they had a trademark on a flavor. And they'd spent better part of a hundred years getting people to believe that trademark had all these intangible values too and people associated it with a flavor and so they were going to tell people not that it was improved because you can't improve a flavor if a flavor is a matter of taste 
I mean, you may improve, improve a detergent or something, but telling you're going to make a major change in a, in a flavor. I mean, so they got this huge deprival super reaction syndrome. Pepsi was within weeks of coming out with old Coke in a Pepsi bottle, which would have been the biggest fiasco in modern times. Perfect, too perfect insanity. And by the way, both Goizuara and Keo are just wonderful about it. I mean, they just joke. I mean, they don't. <laughs> Keo always says, I must have been away on vacation. He participated in every single. He's a wonderful guy. And by the way, Goizuara is a wonderful, smart guy, an engineer. Smart people make these terrible boners. How can you not understand deprival super reaction syndrome? But people, I mean, people do not react symmetrically to loss and gain. Now, maybe a great bridge player like Zeckhauser does, but that's a trained response. Uh, ordinary people, <laughs> subconsciously affected by their inborn tendencies. Uh, bias from envy, jealousy. Well, envy, jealousy made what? Two out of the Ten Commandments. Those of you who have raised siblings, you know about it, or tried to run a law firm or an investment bank or even a faculty. I've heard Warren say a half a dozen times, it's not greed that drives the world, but envy. Here again, you go through the psychology survey courses, and you go to the index, envy, jealousy, thousand page book, it's blank. There's some blind spots in academia, but it's an enormously powerful uh, thing, and it operates to a considerable extent on a subconscious level, and anybody who doesn't understand it is is uh, is taking on defects he shouldn't have. Bias from chemical dependency. Well, we don't have to talk about that. But we've all seen so much of it, but it's interesting how it always causes moral breakdown if there's any need, and uh, and it always involves massive denial. See, it's just, it, it aggravates what we talked about earlier in the aviator case, the tendency to distort reality so that it's endurable. Uh, bias from misgambling compulsion. Well, here Skinner made the only explanation you'll find in the standard psychology survey course. He, he of course, created a variable reinforcement rate for his pigeons, his mice. And he found that that would pound in the behavior better than any other enforcement pattern. And he says, aha, I've explained why gambling is such a powerful, addictive force in a civilization. I think that is, to a very considerable extent, true. But being Skinner, he seemed to think that was the only explanation. But the truth of the matter is that the divisors of these modern machines and techniques know a lot of things that Skinner didn't know. For instance, a lottery. You have a lottery where you get your number by lot, and then somebody draws a number by lot, it gets lousy play. You get a lottery where get, people get to pick their number, get big play. Again, it's this consistency and commitment thing. People think that if they've committed to it, it has to be good. And the minute they've picked it themselves, it gets an extra validity. After all, they thought it and they acted on it. And then if you take slot machines, you get bar, bar, lemon. And it happens again and again and again. You get all these near misses. Well, that's deprival super reaction syndrome. And boy, do the people who, who create the machines understand human psychology. And if you got for the high IQ Q crowd, they've got poker machines where you make choices. So you can play blackjack, so to speak, with the machine. It's wonderful what we've done with our computers to ruin a civilization. But at any rate, misgambling compulsion is a very, very powerful and important thing. Look at what's happening to our country. Every Indian reservation, every river town, and look at the people who were ruined by it with the aid of their stockbrokers and others. Again, if you look in the, in the standard textbook of psychology, you'll find practically nothing on it except maybe one sentence talking about Skinner's rats. That is not an adequate coverage of the subject. Bias from liking distortion, including the tendency to especially like oneself, one's own kind, and one's own idea structures, and the tendency to be especially susceptible to being misled by someone liked. Disliking distortion, bias from that, 
the reciprocal of liking distortion and the tendency not to learn appropriately from someone disliked. Well, here again, we've got hugely powerful tendencies. And if you look at the wars in part of the Harvard Law School, as we say here, you can see that very brilliant people get into this almost pathological behavior. These are very, very powerful, basic, subconscious psychological tendencies, or at least partly subconscious. Now let's get back to B.F. Skinner, man with a hammer syndrome revisited. Why is man with the hammer syndrome always present? Well, if you stop to think about it, it's an of caused bias. His professional reputation is all tied up with what he knows. He likes himself and he likes his own ideas. And, uh, and uh, he's expressed them to other people, consistency and commitment tendency. I mean, you have four or five of these elementary psychological tendencies combining to create this man with a hammer syndrome. And once you realize that, that you can't really buy your thinking done, partly you can, but largely you can't in this world, you've learned a lesson that's very useful in life. George Bernard Shaw said and had a character say in The Doctor's Dilemma, in the last analysis, every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. But he didn't have it quite right, because it isn't so much conspiracy as it is a subconscious psychological tendency. The guy tells you what is good for him. And he doesn't recognize that he's doing anything wrong any more than that doctor did when he was pulling out all those normal gallbladders. And uh, he believes that his own idea structures will cure cancer. And he believes that, that, uh, that the guardian, that the demons that he's the guardian against are the biggest demons and the most important ones. And in fact, they may be very small demons compared to the demons that you face. So you're getting your advice in this world from your paid advisor with this huge load of ghastly bias. And woe to you. There are only two ways to handle it. You can hire your advisor and then just apply a windage factor, like I used to do when I was a rifle shooter. I just didn't just for so many miles an hour of wind. And, or you can learn the basic elements of your advisor's trade. You don't have to learn very much, by the way, because you learn just a little, and then you can make him explain why he's right. And those two tendencies will take part of the warp out of the thinking you've tried to hire done. By and large, it works terribly. I have never seen a management consultant's report in my long life that didn't end with the following paragraph. What this situation really needs is more management consulting. <laughs> never once. I always turn to the last page. Of course, Berkshire Hathaway doesn't hire them, so I only do this on sort of a voyeuristic basis. <clears throat> Sometimes I'm in a non-profit where some idiot hires one. <laughs> 17. Bias from the non-mathematical nature of the human brain in its natural state, as it deals with probabilities employing crude heuristics, and is often misled by mere contrast, a tendency to overweigh conveniently available information, and other psychologically rooted misthinking tendencies on this list. When the brain should be using the simple probability mathematics of Fermat and Pascal, applied to all reasonably obtainable and correctly weighted items of information that are of value in predicting outcomes. The right way to think is the way Zeckhauser plays bridge. It's just that simple. And your brain doesn't naturally know how to think the way Zeckhauser knows how to play bridge. Now, you notice I put in that availability thing, and there I'm mimicking some very eminent psychologists, Kahneman, I hope I pronounced that right, and Tversky, who, who, who raised the idea of availability to a whole heuristic of misjudgment. And you know, they are very substantially right. I mean, ask the Coca-Cola company, which has raised availability to a secular religion, if availability changes behavior. You will drink a hell of a lot more Coke if it's always available. I mean, availability does change behavior and cognition. Nonetheless, even though I recognize that and applaud Tversky and Kahneman, I don't like it for my personal system. 
except as part of a greater subsystem, which is, you got to think the way Zeckhauser plays the bridge. It isn't just the lack of availability that distorts your judgment. All the things on this list distort judgment. And I want to train myself to kind of mentally run down the list instead of just jumping on availability. So that's why I state it the way I do. In a sense, these psychological tendencies make things unavailable. Because if you quickly jump to one thing, and then because you've jumped to it, the, com the consistency and commitment tendency makes you lock in. Boom, that's error number one. Or if something is very vivid, which I'm going to come to next, that will really pound in. And the reason that the thing that really matters is now unavailable, and what's extra vivid wins, is, I mean, it, it, the, the extra vividness creates the unavailability. So I think it's much better to have a whole list of things that, that, that cause you to be less like Zeckhauser than it is just to jump on one factor. Uh, here, I think we should discuss John Gutfriend. This is a very interesting human example which will be taught in every decent professional school for at least a full generation. Good friend has a trusted employee, and it comes to light, not through confession, but by accident, that the trusted employee has lied like hell to the government and manipulated the accounting system, and it was really equivalent to forgery. The man immediately says, I've never done it before, I'll never do it again. It was an isolated example. And of course, it was obvious that he, he wasn't trying to, he was trying to help the government as well as himself, because he thought the government had been dumb enough to pass a, a rule that he'd spoken against. And after all, if a government's not going to pay attention to a bond trader at Solomon, what kind of a government can it be? And, and but at any rate, and this guy has been part of a little clique that has made, uh, well, way into, uh, way over a billion dollars for Solomon in the very recent past. And it's a little handful of people. And so there are a lot of psychological forces at work. And, and you know the guy's wife, and, and he's right in front of you, and there's human sympathy, and he's sort of asking for your help, which is a form which encourages reciprocation. And there are all these psychological tendencies are working, plus the fact he's part of a group that made a lot of money for you. At any rate, good friend does not cashier the man and of course he had done it before and he did do it again well now you look as though you almost wanted him to do it again or god knows what you look like but it isn't good and then that simple decision destroyed john good friend and it's so easy to do now let's think it through like the bridge player like Zeckhauser. You find an isolated example of a little old lady in the Seas Candy Company, one of our subsidiaries, getting into the till. And what does she say? I never did it before. I'll never do it again. This is going to ruin my life. Please help me. And you know her children and her friends. And she's been around 30 years and standing behind the candy counter with swollen ankles. And you're an old lady. It isn't that glorious a life. And you're rich and powerful, and there she is. I never did it before, and I'll never do it again. Well, how likely is it that she never did it before? If you're going to catch 10 embezzlements a year, what are the chances that any one of them, applying what Tversky and Common call baseline information, will be somebody who only did it this once? And the people who have done it before and are going to do it again, what are they all going to say? Well, in the history of the Seas Handy Company, they always say, I never did it before, and I'm never going to do it again. And we cashier them. It would be evil not to, because terribly behavior spreads. Remember, what was it, Serpco? I mean, you, you let that stuff, you got social proof, you got incentive caused bias, you got a whole lot of psychological factors that will cause the evil behavior to spread. And pretty soon the whole damn 
your place is rotten, the civilization is rotten, it's not the right way to behave. I will admit that I have, when I knew the wife and children, I have paid severance pay when I fire somebody for taking a mistress on an extended foreign trip. It's not the adultery I mind, it's the embezzlement. But there, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it where a good friend did it, where they've been cheating somebody else on my behalf. There I think you have to cashier, but if they're just stealing from you and you get rid of them, I don't think you need the last ounce of vengeance. In fact, I don't think you need any vengeance. I don't think vengeance is much good. The, um, the, now we come biased from over-influenced by extra vivid evidence. Here's one. I'm at least $30 million poorer as I sit here giving this little talk because I once bought 300 shares of a stock and the guy called me back and said, I've got 1,500 more. I said, will you hold it for 15 minutes while I think about it? And CEO of this company, I have seen a lot of vivid peculiarities in a long life, but this guy set a world record. I'm talking about the CEO, and I just misweighed it. The truth of the matter is his situation was foolproof, he was soon going to be dead. I turned down the extra 1,500 shares, and that's now cost me $30 million, and that's life in the big city. And it wasn't something where stock was generally available. So it's very easy to misweigh the vivid evidence, and Goodfriend did that when he looked into the man's eyes and, and forgave the colleague. 22. Stress-induced mental changes, small and large, temporary and permanent. The, uh, oh no, 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 I've, I've skipped one. Mental confusion caused by information not arrayed in the mind in theory structures creating sound generalizations developed in response to the question why. Also misinfluence from information that apparently but not really answers the question why. Also failure to obtain deserved influence caused by not properly explaining why. But we all know people who flunk and they try and memorize and they try and spout back and they just, it just doesn't work. The brain doesn't work that way. You've got to array facts on theory structures answering the question why. If you don't do that, you just, you cannot handle the world. And now we get to Forstein, who was the general counsel of Salomon when Goodfriend made his big error. And Forstein knew better. He told Goodfriend, you have to report this as a matter of morality and prudent business judgment. He said, it's probably not illegal, there's probably no legal duty to do it, but you have to do it as a matter of, of prudent conduct and, and proper dealing with your main customer. And he said that to Goodfriend on at least two or three occasions. And he stopped. And of course, the persuasion failed. And when Goodfriend went down, Forstein went with him. And it ruined a considerable part of Forstein's life. Well, Forstein, who was a member of the Harvard Law Review, made an elementary psychological mistake. You want to persuade somebody, you really tell them why. And what have we learned in lesson one? Incentives really matter. He should have told, and vivid evidence really works? He should have told get good friend, <laughs> you are likely to ruin your life and disgrace your family and lose your money. And is Mosier worth this? I know both men, that would have worked. So Forstein flunked elementary psychology, this very sophisticated, brilliant lawyer. But don't you do that. It's not very hard to do, you know, just to, to remember that why is terribly important. Uh, other normal limitations of sensation, memory, cognition, and knowledge. Well, I don't have time for that. Uh, Stress-induced mental changes. Here my favorite example is, is, is the great Pavlov. And he had all these dogs in cages, which had all been conditioned into changed behaviors. And the great Leningrad flood came, and the just went right up and the dog's in a cage and the dog was had as much stress as you can imagine a dog ever having and the water receded in time to save some of the dogs and, and Pavlov noted that they'd had a total reversal of their conditioned personality. Well, being the great scientist he was, he spent the rest of his life giving nervous breakdowns to dogs and, <laughs> and, and he learned a, 
a hell of a lot that I regard as very interesting. I have never known any Freudian analyst who knew anything about the last work of Pavlov, and I've never met a lawyer who understood that what Pavlov found out with those dogs had anything to do with programming and deprogramming and cults and so forth. I mean, the amount of, of elementary psychological ignorance that is out there in high levels is, is very subtle. Then we've got other common mental illnesses and declines, temporary and permanent, including the tendency to lose ability through disuse. And then I've got mental and organizational confusion from say something syndrome. And here my favorite thing is the bee, the honeybee. And the honeybee goes out and finds the nectar and he comes back and he does a dance that communicates to the other bees where the nectar is and they go out and get it. Well, some scientist who was clever, like B.F. Skinner, decided to do an experiment. He put the nectar straight up way up. Well, in a natural setting, there is no nectar way the hell straight up. And the poor honeybee doesn't have a genetic program that is adequate to handle what he now has to communicate. And you'd think the honeybee would come back to the hive and slink into a corner. But he doesn't. He comes into the hive and does this incoherent dance. And all my life I've been dealing with the human equivalent of that honeybee. <laughs> and and it's a very important part of human organization to set things up so the noise and the reciprocation and so forth of all these people who have what I call say something syndrome don't really affect the decisions. Now, the time has come to ask two or three questions. And this is the most important question in this whole talk. What happens when these standard psychological tendencies combine? What happens when the situation or the artful manipulation of man causes several of these tendencies to operate on a person toward the same end at the same time? The clear answer is the combination greatly increases power to change behavior compared to the power of merely one tendency acting alone. Examples are Tupperware parties. Tupperware has now made billions of dollars out of a few manipulative psychological tricks. It was so schlock that directors of Justin Dart's company resigned when he crammed it down his board's throat. And he was totally right, by the way, judged by economic outcomes. Mooney conversion methods. Boy, do they work. He just combines four or five of these things together. The system of Alcoholics Anonymous. A 50% no drinking rate outcome when everything else fails. It's a very clever system that uses four or five psychological systems at once toward, I might say, a very good end. The Milgram experiment. See, Milgram, it's been widely interpreted as mere obedience. But the truth of the matter is that the experimenter who got the students to give the heavy shocks in Milgram, he explained why. It was a false explanation. We need this to look for scientific truth and so on. That greatly changed the behavior of the people. And number two, he worked them up. Tiny shock, little larger, little larger. So commitment and consistency tendency and the contrast principle were both working in favor of this behavior. So again, it's four different psychological tendencies. That's when you get these Lollapalooza effects, you will almost always find four or five of these things working together. When I was young, there was a whodunit hero who always said, Cherchez la femme. And the, what you should search for in life is the combination. Because the combination is likely to do you in. Or if you're the inventor of Tupperware parties, it's likely to make you enormously rich if you can stand shaving when you do it. <laughs> then one of my favorite cases is the McDonnell Douglas airliner evacuation disaster. The government requires that airliners pass a, a bunch of tests while it's evacuation. Get everybody out, I think it's 90 seconds or something like that. It's some short period of time. The government has rules, make it very realistic, so on and so on. You can't select nothing but 20-year-old athletes to evacuate your airliner. So McDonnell Douglas schedules one of these things in a hangar, and they make the hangar dark, and the concrete floor is 25 feet down, and they got these little rubber chutes, and they got all these old people, and they ring the bell, and they all rush out, and in the morning, when the first test is done, they create, I don't know, 20 terrible injuries that will go off to hospitals. And of course, they've scheduled another one for the afternoon. Uh, by the way, they didn't meet the time schedule either, in addition to causing all the injuries. Well, uh, so what do they do? They do it again in the afternoon. Now they create 20 more injuries and one case of a severed spinal column. 
with permanent unfixable paralysis. These are engineers, these are brilliant people, this is thought over through in a big bureaucracy. Again, it's a combination of attendance. Authorities told you to do it. He told you to make it realistic. You've decided to do it. You've decided to do it twice. Incentive caused bias. If you pass, you save a lot of money. You've got to jump this hurdle before you can sell your new airliner. Again, three, four, five of these things work together and it turns human brains into mush. And maybe you think this doesn't happen in picking investments? <laughs> if so, you're living in a different world than I am. Finally, the open outcry auction. Well, the open outcry auction is just made to turn the brain into mush. You get social proof, the other guy is bidding, you get reciprocation tendency, you get deprival super reaction syndrome, the thing is going away. I mean, it's just absolutely it's designed to, to manipulate people into idiotic behavior. Finally, the institution of the board of directors of a major human American company. Well, the top guy is sitting there, he's an authority figure. He's doing asinine things. You look around the board, nobody else is objecting. Social proof, it's okay. Reciprocation tendency, he's raising the director's fees every year. He's flying you around in the corporate airplane to look at interesting plants or whatever the hell they do. And you go, and you really get extreme dysfunction as a corrective decision-making body in the typical American board of directors. They only act, again, the power of incentives, they only act when it gets so bad that it starts reflecting, making them look foolish or threatening legal liability to them. That's Munger's rule. I mean, there are occasional uh, things that don't follow Munger's rule, but by and large, the board of directors is a very ineffective corrector if the, if the top guy is a little nuts, which of course frequently happens. The second question. Isn't this list of standard psychological tendencies improperly tautological compared with the system of Euclid? That is, aren't there overlaps, and can't some items on the list be derived from combinations of other items? The answer to that is plainly yes. Three, what good is in the practical world is the thought system indicated by the list? Isn't practical benefit prevented because these psychological tendencies are programmed into the human mind by broad evolution, so we can't get rid of them? Broad evolution, I mean the combination of genetic and cultural evolution, but mostly genetic. Well, the answer is the tendencies are partly good, and indeed probably much more good than bad, otherwise they wouldn't be there. By and large, these rules of thumb have worked pretty well for man, given his limited mental capacity, and that's why they were programmed in by, by broad evolution. At any rate, they can't be simply washed out automatically, and they shouldn't be. Nonetheless, the psychological thought system described is very useful in spreading wisdom and good conduct and un when one understands it and uses it constructively. Here are some examples. Carl Braun's communication practices. He designed oil refineries with spectacular skill and integrity. He had a very simple rule. Remember I said why is important? You got fired in the Braun company. You had to have five W's. You had to tell who, what you wanted to do, where and when, and you had to tell him why. And if you wrote a communication and left out the why, you got fired. Because Braun knew it's complicated building an oil refinery. And it can blow up, all kinds of things happen. And he knew that his communication system worked better if you always told him why. Well, that's a simple discipline, and boy does it work. Two, the use of simulators in pilot training. Here again, abilities attenuate with disuse. Well, the simulator is God's gift because you can keep them fresh. The system of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's certainly a constructive use of somebody understanding psychological tendencies. I think they just blundered into it, as a matter of fact. So you can regard it as kind of an evolutionary outcome. But just because they blundered into it doesn't mean you can't invent its equivalent when you need it for a good purpose. Clinical training in medical schools. Here's a profoundly correct way of understanding psychology. The standard practice is Watch one, do one, teach one. Boy, does that pound in what you want pounded in. Again, the consistency and commitment tendency. That is a profoundly correct way to teach clinical medicine. The rules of the U.S. Constitutional Com Convention. Totally secret, no vote until the final vote, then just one vote on the whole Constitution. Very clever psychological rules. And if they had a different procedure, everybody would have been 
pushed into a corner by his own pronouncements and his own oratory and his own and, well, and no recorded votes until the last one. And they got it through by a whisker with those wise rules. We wouldn't have had the Constitution if our forefathers hadn't been so psychologically acute. And look at the crowd we got now. <laughs> Six, the use of granny's rule. I love this. One of the psychologists who works with the center gets paid a fortune running around America, and he teaches executives to manipulate themselves. Now, granny's rule is you, you don't get the ice cream unless you eat your carrots. Well, granny was a very wise woman. That is a very good system. So this guy, very eminent psychologist, he runs around the country telling executives to organize their day. So they force themselves to do what's unpleasant and important by doing that first and then rewarding themselves with something they really like doing. He is profoundly correct. Seven, the Harvard Business School's emphasis on decision trees. When I was young and foolish, I used to laugh at the Harvard Business School. I said, they're teaching 28-year-old people that high school algebra works in real life. We're talking about elementary probability. But later I... I wised up and I realized that it was very important that they do that and better late than never. Eight, the use of postmortems at Johnson and Johnson. In most corporations, if you make an acquisition and it works out to be a disaster, all the paperwork and presentations that caused the dumb acquisition to be made are quickly forgotten. You got denial, you got everything in the world. You got Pavlovian association tenants, and nobody wants to even be associated with the damn thing or even mention it. Johnson and Johnson, they make everybody revisit their old acquisitions and wade through the presentations. That is a very smart thing to do. And by the way, I do the same thing routinely. Nine, the great example of Charles Darwin is he avoided confirmation bias. Darwin probably changed my life because I'm a biography nut. And, and I, when I found out the way he always paid extra attention to the disconfirming evidence, and all these little psychological tricks. I also found out that he wasn't very smart by the standards, the ordinary standards of human acuity. Yet there he is, buried in Westminster Abbey. That's not where I'm going, I'll tell you. And, and I said, my God, here's a guy that, by all objective evidence, is not nearly as smart as I am, and he's in Westminster Abbey. He must have tricks I should learn. And I started wearing little hair shirts like Darwin to try and train myself out of these subconscious psychological tendencies that cause so many errors. It didn't work perfectly, as you can tell from listening to this talk, but it would have, it would have been even worse if I hadn't, hadn't done what I did. And you can know these psychological tendencies and avoid being the patsy of all the people that are trying to manipulate you to your disadvantage, like Sam Walton. Sam Walton will let a purchasing agent take a handkerchief from a salesman. He knows how powerful the subconscious reciprocation tendency is. That is a profoundly correct way for Sam Walton to behave. Then there's the Warren Buffett rule for open outcry auctions. Don't go. <laughs> we don't go to the closed bid auctions, too, because they uh, that's a counterproductive way to do things ordinarily for a different reason, which Zeckhauser would understand. Four. What special knowledge problems lie buried in the thought system indicated by the list? Well, one is paradox. Now we're talking about a type of human wisdom that the more people learn about it, the more attenuated the wisdom gets. That's an intrinsically paradoxical kind of wisdom. But we have paradox in mathematics, and we don't give up mathematics. I say, damn, the paradox this stuff is wonderfully useful. And by the way, the... The granny's rule, when you apply it to yourself, is sort of a paradox in a paradox. The, manip the manipulation still works even though you know you're doing it. And I've seen that done by one person to another. I drew this beautiful woman as my dinner partner a few years ago, and I'd never seen her before, although she's married to a prominent Angelino. And she sat down next to me, and she turned her beautiful face up, and she said, Charlie, she said, what one word accounts for your remarkable success in life. Now, I knew I was being manipulated and that she'd done this before, and I just loved it. <laughs> I, I, I never see this woman without a little lift in my spirits. <laughs> and by the way, I told her I was rational. <laughs> You'll have to judge yourself whether that's true. I, I may be 
demonstrating some psychological tendency I hadn't planned on demonstrating. <laughs> How should the best parts of psychology and economics interrelate in an enlightened economist's mind? Two views. That's the thermodynamics model. You, you know, you can't derive thermodynamics from, from Newtonian uh, gravity and, and, uh, and laws of mechanics, even though it's a lot of little particles interacting. And here's this wonderful truth that you can sort of develop on your own, which is thermodynamics. And some economists, and I think Milton Friedman is in this group, but I may be wrong on that, sort of like the thermodynamics model. I think Milton Friedman, Friedman, who has a Nobel Prize, is probably a little wrong on that. I think the thermodynamics analogy is overstrained. I think knowledge from these different soft sciences have to be reconciled to eliminate conflict. After all, there's nothing in thermodynamics that's inconsistent with Newtonian mechanics and gravity. And I think that some of these economic theories are not totally consistent with other knowledge and they have to be bent and I think that these behavioral economics or economists are probably the ones that are bending them in a correct direction. Now my prediction is when the economists take a little psychology into account that the reconciliation will be quite endurable and here my model is the precession of the equinoxes. The world would be simpler for a long-term climatologist if the angle of the axis of the Earth's rotation compared to the plane of the ecliptic were absolutely fixed. But it isn't fixed. Over every 40,000 years or so, there's this little wobble. And that has pronounced long-term effects. Well, in many cases, what psychology is going to add is just a little wobble, and it will be endurable. Uh, here I, I quote another hero of mine, who of course is Einstein, where he said, the Lord is subtle but not malicious. And I, I don't think it's going to be that hard to bend economics a little to, to um, accommodate what's right in psychology. The final question is, if the thought system indicated by this list of psychological tendencies has great value not widely recognized and employed, what should the educational system do about it? I am not going to answer that one now. I, I like leaving a little mystery. Now let me move on to Warren. Big Daddy Omaha. I've not looked at Wikipedia recently. Is he the richest guy now? I'm not sure. The wealthiest or not debate aside, I found this presentation via C-SPAN, and I think you're going to enjoy the perspective. Testing. One million, two million, three million. That's working. Okay. <laughs> I, I'd like to... Uh, talk to you about your financial future, and I hope those figures become applicable to all of you as we go along. At, uh, uh, and I'd like to start uh, by posing a problem for you. And so I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes, and we'll do Q&A, because I, what we want to do is talk about what's on your mind. But I'd like you to think about this for just a second. If as we walked out of here today, I said I would like to buy 10% of your financial future. I was going to write you a check today, and from this day forth, you were going to give me 10% of everything you earned. Uh, how much would you want to charge me for that? I'm going to buy one-tenth of you. I may take the low bid, incidentally, so be careful what you uh, <laughs> write down. Well, I think if you thought about that a little while, as you, you can contemplate that for a few minutes. You know, you're going to get a check from me today. You can do anything you want with the money, but... From this day forth, you have to give me 10% of what you earn. I think it would be very foolish of you, any of you, if you asked for less than, say, $50,000. Now, it's going to be a few years before you're out earning money, and so I've got a few years of dead money there. But then I would start getting this royalty on you as you went along. I really think that if you thought about it, you'd, you'd, most of you would want a fair amount more than that. I think you'd be right. Uh, fortunately, I didn't make this deal with anybody when I started out, so and nobody's got a 10% royalty on me. But uh, I think that 50000 would sort of be the absolute minimum. And if you think about that, that means that right today, you are worth 500000 because if 10% of you is worth 50000 in cash today, your potential 
is worth a minimum on a 100% basis of $500,000. That is the big financial asset you've got. It's way more important what you do with that $500,000 asset that you own today than whether you decide to buy stocks or bonds or whether you put your money in a mutual fund or pick your own stocks or anything of that sort. The biggest financial asset that you have going for you by miles is the value of your own earning power over the years. So that's really what you should focus on. If you're focusing on your financial fo future, that means you should focus on you. Because whether your 10% is worth 50,000 or 100,000 or 300,000, which would be 500,000 or a million or three million for all of you, whether it turns out to be one or the other is really dependent uh, in a very large part on what you do in the next few years. All of you in this room have the brains to do extremely well in life. You've all got the energy to do extremely well in life. And then the question is, how do you apply it? If you've got a 200 horsepower motor, do you get 200 horsepower out of it? Do you get your full potential or do you get 100 horsepower or 50 horsepower? Now there's two things that can hold you back in getting the full horsepower out of your, your engine, whatever it may be. All of you have big enough engines. And one of those is a lack of education, but that probably isn't going to happen to very many people in this room. If you did have a lack of education, if you didn't, if you didn't have a chance to get a decent education in life, it wouldn't make any difference what that potential was because you'd never unlock it. But the second most important thing, and equally as important, is in terms of the habits that you develop, in terms of what you do with yourself. When we hire people, we look for three qualities. We look for integrity, we look for intelligence, and we look for energy. But if they don't have the first one, integrity, the other two will kill you. Because if you're hiring somebody without integrity, you really want them to be dumb and lazy, don't you? I mean, you know, the last thing in the world you want for them is to be smart and energetic. So smart and energetic only goes with integrity. You know, you make your own decision on that. You can't change your IQ or how far you can throw a football or how high you can jump or the color of your hair very easily. But you can elect to have integrity that matches anybody else's. And if you match that with intelligence, which you have, and energy, which you have, uh, you will get an extraordinary result. And you'd be very foolish to sell me 10% of yourself for 50000 On the other hand, if you don't match it with that, your potential will, in a significant part, go unused. And I'll give you a little simple test to apply in terms of thinking about the kind of habits you want to develop. Because you can have any habits you want to be. You can be, you can be lazy, you can be prompt, you can be, you can be late, you can be honest, you can cut corners. I mean, you have all these choices. And those are choices for you to make. Nobody else is going to make them for you. And I would suggest that you play this little game with me, too. Think about the person you would most like to be in life. Maybe it's one of your contemporaries, maybe it's somebody a little older, but pick out the person you admire the most, the person that you'd change places with if you could. And then write down why you admire them. Just put it on a piece of paper. And then figure out the person that you would least like to change places with. Who really turns you off? Who do you find repulsive? And list the reasons why that person turns you off so much and put those down on the other side of the paper. And then look at that list. And you'll find that everything on the left-hand side, what, what you admire in other people, the qualities they bring to life, um, cheerfulness, you know, generosity, all kinds of things, you'll find those are things you can do yourself. It's very simple. You gotta apply yourself, but the habits you form in doing that early on will carry you through life. And on the other hand, you'll find that the things that make people repulsive Selfishness, obnoxiousness, all these things, egotism, are things that no one has to have. If you find those in yourself, you can get rid of them as long as you get rid of them early. So all I suggest is that you write, you write down a list of what, what you admire, what you find uh, contemptible, and decide that you know, the ones on the, on the ad, ad, admired side are, are ones you're going to acquire for yourself. And if you do that when you're young, it'll carry you through the rest of your life. This doesn't work if you do it when you're 50 or 60. By then the habits are too well formed. Uh, but if you do it early, behavior becomes, becomes a habit. So if you do that, two or three years from now, if you go through the same exercise, you'll find out that the person you admire the most is yourself. 
that can be a little dangerous under some circumstances, but it, uh, uh, but it's not a, it's not a bad thing. I mean, you want to be somebody you like, and you don't want to be somebody that you that you dislike, and and uh, form those habits early. It, you basically can't miss. Now, I'll give you one other small piece of advice that's just a corollary on this, and then we'll get to your questions. And and that is, as a general matter, as a one piece of specific finance fin, uh, financial advice, I would say, you know, avoid credit cards. Just forget about them. Uh, we're in various businesses that issue credit cards. The American public loves credit cards. But if you start revolving debt on credit cards, you're going to be paying uh, 18 or 20 percent. And you can't make progress in your financial life going around borrowing money at 18 or 20 percent. You can make a lot of money by lending it out at 18 or 20 percent over time. I, you know, if you can find anybody that's good that uh, will borrow from you. But you don't want to be on the side of the equation that's always behind in life. Uh, you know, I was lucky. I'd saved about ten thousand dollars by the time I got out of school. That ten thousand dollars was really worth millions I might have earned later on because after you get a family and everything the, the expenses roll in but but those were my tools to work with but it was only because I was ahead of the game if you're behind the game by ten thousand dollars at some point and paying 18 or 20 percent interest on it you will never you know you'll never get out of it the trick I've got a partner that says all I want to know is where I'm going to die so I'll never go there you know and uh, and that's true in financial matters as well you want to figure out where you don't want to be uh, ahead of time and avoid that. And I get about a dozen letters a day from people who are having terrible problems. And there are two reasons why they have terrible problems. One is a number of them have had health problems of some sort. I mean, they have really been hit by some, or somebody in their family has been hit by some kind of catastrophic uh, illness. And that is a, you know, it's a terrible thing to happen to any family. And they get in, they run up bills they can't pay, and, and really only society can solve that one. Uh, uh, in terms of protecting people against that. It, that's just plain bad luck. But the other one is from people who run up credit card debt and uh, they're facing bankruptcy or they've been through bankruptcy once before and they owe a whole bunch of money and they can't, they can't even pay the interest, let alone pay any principal. And half of my letters come from people like that and that, that, that problem is avoidable. Catastrophic illness is not, but, but uh, credit card debt is something you bring on yourself and it's way better it's way easier to stay out of trouble than to get out of trouble financially. And I will guarantee if you run a big credit card debt, you will be in trouble uh, probably the rest of your life in terms of uh, your financial situation. On the other hand, if you get ahead of the game, even if it's on a very modest scale, so that money is coming in from investing and you're, uh, you're, uh, you, people owe you money or equities owe you ownership, uh, you'll be way ahead of the game compared to paying it uh, be, always been paying uh, your creditors every month. So my advice to you is uh, if you can't pay for it, don't buy it. Get yourself in a position where you can pay for anything. Then we'll be glad to see you at Borsheim's or the Nebraska Furniture Market. <laughs> As I said at the beginning, these two guys have strategy that we can't employ. Survivorship bias? Arguably, they're it. They're the guys that are still standing when everyone else is gone for their particular strategy. But don't let that take away from the sound philosophical foundation they lay out. Because even if you can't employ their strategy, you can take their way of thinking and apply it to your strategy. Beyond a doubt, 100% guaranteed. You got to know when the hold up, know when the fold up, walk away and know when to run you never count your money when you're sitting at the table there'll be time enough for counting when the deal is done i see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up down and surprise markets whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email 
michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.